I think the environment we are in should be that we have sticky core inflation. That sticky inflation is still the main concern. We do think that inflation will decelerate more meaningfully than the Fed is expecting. Our base case is still that the Fed probably only has one more <clears throat> interest rate hike in their pocket. What needs to happen is consumers need to feel that they might lose their jobs. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramwitz, and Tom Keen. It's a Friday before the beginning of the summer. We welcome all of you to the end of Q2. What a first half it has been. Pulling the short straw, Catherine Greifeld with us today. Katie Greifeld, who has a full Friday ahead of you because she is front and center. Amy, let's get the promotion out right now. <laughs> Top of the show this afternoon. Stay tuned for the real yield because the real yield is the only thing that matters on this Friday morning. Katie, the real yield's breaking out to new inflation expectation highs. I mean, if we look at the five year, we're above 2% on that real yield. You take a look at the two year, we're on. 3% watch. I'm glad that you <clears throat> told me first thing this morning to look at the real yield because you're right. I mean, they are absolutely rocketing higher. 1.68% well, on the 10-year real yield. That's up a solid 10 basis points. 1.58 blowing out to 1.68. Point... And Katie, that takes us back to yesterday. I thought the team did great about the shock of Bill Dudley's essay framing out in this coming quarter, mm -hmm. we need to look for a higher yield regime. And he was almost immediately vindicated because I think we got that essay at 6 a.m. And then 8.30, we got jobless claims, we got uh, GDP, and that actually led J.P. Morgan to ditch their bullish Treasury right. view. So an immediate rethinking on the heels of that. Keep this up. This is the quote we showed yesterday, folks, on radio. In sum, this suggests a 10-year Treasury note yield of 1.4, of uh, 4.5 percent. The former head of the New York Fed does the Frank Fabozzi exercise on where yields are heading. That changes everyone out there. It changes global Wall Street, changes your mortgage, your rent, everything out there to get the higher regime. Where are we? June 30. Let's bring up the drawdown chart. We did this when nobody believed in this bull market. We are down, down, down. SPX down 8% from the record highs. Dow Jones now down 6%. NASDAQ, even with the move, NASDAQ down 10%. Katie, the NASDAQ led by that Apple 3 trillion. I mean, NASDAQ is up 20 some percent off the bottom. And that's pretty amazing that we're still 10% down from that all-time high. Really tells you how big that hole was for those big tech stocks. And a lot of that was predicated on the fact <clears throat> that you do have rates moving significantly higher. It seems like that's not necessarily a hurdle anymore. Let's do the data check right now. Dive into it here. Katie's going to brief you on a huge economic uh, Friday. Futures Lift. There's no other way uh, to put it. NASDAQ leading the way. Futures up 14. Dow futures up 72. And, and the VIX 13.44. You wonder if we get a 12 print today within the melt up that we see. 10-year yield 3.88%. Really, the yields bear a lot of scrutiny on a technical uh, basis to see if we do get a breakout. Uh, and yields 210 spread really back to recent historic lows, negative 104 uh, basis points. Oil with a bit of a lift. West Texas American oil above $70. A barrel dollar with some strength yesterday, Euro 108.46. And Katie, uh, into the brief here, let's brief that Governor Bailey's enjoying a weaker sterling, 126.36. And we'll see how uh, that whole board changes at 8.30 this morning. We do have a lot of eco data coming out, including PCE, of course, the Fed's preferred inflation measure. We're expecting a cooling across the board there. We also get personal income and spending numbers. And then at 10 a.m., you're going to get University of Michigan sentiment readings. I'm really interested to see the inflation expectations in that report. Definitely one to watch. Uh, moving on. This is interesting. We're also on Supreme Court watch. Of course, we got the decision on affirmative action <coughs> yesterday. We're awaiting a decision possibly today on the Biden administration's student loan cancellation plans. Of course, that potentially impacts 40 million people. So a lot of people keeping an eye out for that decision to come. And we are on Apple $3 trillion watch. The number to watch is $190.80. If you look at where Apple is in mm -hmm. free market trading, we're above that. So we're there. That would make Apple the first company to reach that 
three trillion dollar market cap milestone. We'll see if that holds through to 4 p.m. today. In the next hour, we're going to touch on this. Dan Ives scheduled to be with us. I believe we're not going to see Mr. Ives uh, today. He's got a family matter. But the answer is Dan Ives uh, modeling out four trillion. We'll talk about that in the next hour. Again, futures up 14. Part of the collective memory that John and I have about bulls and bears is people that are out switch their mind and get it right. One of those is Max Kettner, chief multi-asset strategist at HFCC. We joined him in London ages ago, and he said, you know what, up. We get a brief today from the gentleman who got this rally right. Max, give us a redo here. How have you recalibrated for Q3 of 2023? Yeah, uh, good morning, Tom. Uh, not an awful lot, really, because from a fundamental perspective, I don't think an awful lot really has changed yet. Uh, when we look actually at the U.S. economy, I think particularly against uh, initial expectations, the U.S. economy is just doing fine, right? The consumer is doing fine. The services sector is fine. Uh, look at all the concerns we had around the housing sector, around commercial real estate. The reality is, I think you guys uh, at Bloomberg are running uh, one of those surprise indices about the U.S. housing and real estate uh, activity, and that's on a 20-year high, right? So the, the U.S. economy is really doing fine. So, so quite frankly, I don't think those recession calls that we're still having for Q3 and Q4, and in particular for the, U, for the U.S. economy, that these recession calls are really, really going to uh, come to fruition. I really do think that those recession calls will continue to be misplaced. And right. if anything, the risk is that things are continuing to be much, much better than expected and that we will have another sort of short-end rate repricing. Uh, Max Kettner, fold in here the linkage of economics to the markets, which I'm going to take through nominal GDP. If we have a persistent inflation or, dare I say, even a breakout higher in rates on a broad global basis, and if we get some form of real GDP like the surprise of America – does that provide persistency to corporate revenues forward? Uh, yeah, I think it does. When we look at earnings, actually at earnings growth over the last sort of 30, 40 years, you overlay that with things like headline inflation. You know, that usually does provide some tailwind because, as you said, right, that this is the discussion that we should be focused on much, much more rather than looking at, you know, credit crunches and commercial real estate and debt ceiling and, you know, in effect, really some sort of when is the recession finally going to hit? Instead of that, we should be talking much more about, well, do we really care right now about real GDP growth? Or as an investor, like you were saying, right, the connection to markets is real versus nominal. And in effect, really, we should be caring much, much more about nominal growth, nominal earnings. <clears throat> and they're growing just fine. And think about Q2, the Q2 reporting season that's going to start in a couple of weeks. Consensus expectations, again, are only for flat growth, Q2 over Q1. They are, you know, they've been massively downgraded for cyclical sectors, for sectors like consumer discretionary, energy, materials, even tech, right? Even the tech earnings expectations have been downgraded by more than 10% in the last five months. So I do struggle to see a big, big decline or a big, big downside surprise in earnings, particularly now in the, in the Q2 reporting season. Well, let's talk about the next half of the year that we're sailing into. I want to talk a little bit about the expectations for the relative asset classes. Of course, there was a lot of doom and gloom about the corporate earnings picture. And this was really supposed to be the year of the bond, the year of fixed income. It looks like it just turned into another year for equities, specifically another year for big tech. Is that the dynamic heading into the second half? Is that how we're going to end 2023? Um, I think, well, I'm going to give you the classic strategist answer, yes and no, and it depends. Um, I think what, what it's going to be is, I think at the beginning of Q3, I think, Katie, you're correct. It's going to be more of the same, right? More bit of sort of growthy, you know, the kind of Goldilocks environment where we're in right now because growth is fine. Inflation, headline inflation is still going down. So that's sort of really, really Goldilocksy. The problem, I think, will come in late summer and towards Q4 when we realize, look, Inflation could, and particularly headline inflation in the U.S., could start to pick up again because some of those energy base effects will fade, right? They will converge to zero. Um, so we're going to have a bit of a mechanical push higher for, for headline inflation again. And then, of course, the economy doing much, much better. And that, in my mind, really will then 
uh, favor value over growth. So that will then really make a switch from those big tech names into the more value and short duration names towards the end of the summer and into the fall. How do valuations factor into that call for this rally to broaden out outside of just, you know, mega cap tech, which has absolutely been dominating? Uh, the short answer is not at all, nothing, right? Valuations don't matter, right? They really, really don't matter to me at all in the short term. If we're talking about the next seven to 10 years, they're the thing that should matter the most. If we're talking about the next three to six months, they are, quite frankly, a random number. If you look at, you know, the explanatory power of uh, both outright and, and absolute valuations of equities and also relative right. valuations, things like equity risk premium uh, and the explanatory power with sort of six to 12 month performance, it is somewhere between two to three percent. So they don't really matter, right? So to me, the valuation side of things, they don't really matter. It's more the inflation and the rates trajectory, right, and particularly inflation, the sticky inflation part that matters for the next six months. The, the, the left tail outlier right now, and we covered this yesterday, Max Kettner, with an important essay by William Dudley, the former president of the New York Fed, who modeled out a 4.5% U.S. tenure. But the thing that no one's predicting is a higher interest rate regime. That goes against Steve Major. That goes against David Bloom and a lot of the HSBC research heritage. Are you guys prepared for the possibility of higher interest rates? Uh, not quite yet, because I think we're still in this Goldilocks environment, right, where, you know, yields have sort of peaked from, from last year. I think it is really a risk for the second half. It's not a base case. It is a risk, though, not on the long end, more on the front end. Because yeah. Let's remember that, you know, futures are still pricing around 150 basis points of rate cuts between the end of this year and the end of next year. So it is really one of those risks, I think, that if the majority of those rate cuts will be sort of pushed into 2025, not saying that there won't be any rate cuts at all next year. But if the market temporarily shifts its expectations you know, from 2024 into 2025, that has massive, massive implications from an asset allocation <clears throat> perspective, because what we just talked about in that environment, if that risk does, if that tail risk, that left-hand side risk really does uh, uh, pan out, you really absolutely don't want to be in growth names. You want to be shifting into the value names, perhaps even into the cyclical value names, uh, uh, rather than really having the long duration and, and tech assets. Max Kettner, thank you so much for the June 30 brief. Mr. Kettner is with HSBC. This is such a so interesting, uh, Katie, the idea of the percentage of people that didn't participate in a seven or eight stock bull market. Some of them are up fractionally. And maybe if they're institutional, their customers, their clients are saying, their accounts are saying, OK, why don't we own Apple? I mean, I really wonder, are we getting almost an October, November window dressing here, folks, into Q3 mm -hmm. from the institutional pressure of get our acts together after missing this mother of all six-month bull markets? Right, and then you're left chasing the rally. And it's really interesting to hear Max say that valuations in the short term, they don't matter to him. That's not what he's looking at. Because if you think of the rallying cry of bears, sort of the touchstone, it's that, OK, all of these stocks, these seven, eight stocks, they have to come down at some point if you just look at the valuations. Well, they, OK, they got to come down at some point as they do. But the other thing is we've talked over the, the last couple of days, folks, is the memory of how you construct a second leg of a bull market. The optimists clearly feel that. I'm not advocating that. But, but I, I would say... Yeah, you come off the mat with all the emotion of OMG, October, up we go. And the now what is really front and center here is a gamble mm -hmm. or a guesstimate into Labor Day. But I really think what you brought up, the idea that maybe rates new, do need to be higher, perhaps structurally higher, if we get structurally higher inflation, that is still very much a hurdle. Katie Greifeld with us here. Lisa Bramos and John Farrell off of their own assignment, as they say, into a long weekend. Program note, Monday, we're open. <laughs> I didn't know I was coming in. I may have the flip-flops and the floaties on. Stay with us on a Friday. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Unfortunately, again, we still need a lot of support 
this year the Ukrainian budget is fully funded. Uh, we are discussing 2024 now, and that will require all of our friends and partners, including all G7 countries, to help us to go through 2024, uh, regardless of where we are on the battlefield and how fast we will win. The ambassador of Ukraine to the United States, managing the message forward here, of course, just in a week ago or so, the tumult, the shock we all had of the upset, the mutiny in Russia and the ramifications of that, the odd rumors and all this week. We say good morning to all of you here on the final day of the second quarter of 2023. We've got some wonderful market guests coming up, trying to figure out the way forward in this bull market, what we see in bonds, currencies, and commodities as well. I should note oil, 69.98, with a little bit of a lift uh, this morning. And futures do what they've done, confound people from October. <clears throat> right now, we turn to Europe. We could spend an hour with Maria today or this morning in Brussels, but don't have that time. We have enough time, though, to address the fact, Maria, that if you come out of New York City in three airports, all points for tourists point to Paris. And the immense guilt that Americans have is that we visit three arrondissements, maybe five, in Paris. Everything is wonderful until it's not. And right now across France, it is really ugly. This is not just about Paris, folks, with Mr. Macron moving home to begin to uh, deal with these protests. Maria, brief us now on the urgency of Mr. Macron's weekend. Well, very urgent, Tom, because he has decided not to do a press conference here in Brussels. Very unusual. <laughs> Frankly, I cover him all the time, and I don't remember a press conference that was canceled in Brussels. We know he loves the international politics, but now he's decided it's time to focus on the situation that is going on in France. We know that there has been now three days of protests, at times violent. We know there was a shooting of a 17-year-old. And we should stress, in Europe, it is not usual to see the police that shoot to kill. So obviously every time that happens, there is major pushback. The issue for Emmanuel Macron is that he had promised to the French people that by the French National Day on July 14th, protests <clears throat> would be in the past and the country would be forward looking to a bright future. At this point, he's going back right. to deal with streets that are burning. We're being told that this is a major concern for the president, that he has been on his phone for 48 hours and now decided, I can't stay in Brussels, I have to go back home. The distance from Pont Neuf out to Nanterre one of the poorer parts of Paris where all this tension uh, began, and maybe it's a part that Americans don't see, speaks to the conservative lift in Europe. We see it in Italy, Maria Tadeo. We see it across Eastern Europe. Has there been a new conservative surge in Germany, in Macron's France, and even for that matter in Northern Europe? I look, he's hoping to avoid that, but there has been a shift in politics in Europe. You saw that play out in Italy, in Sweden, in Finland. You have an election coming up in Spain. The conservatives are polling uh, very well. And for Emmanuel Macron, frankly, it's difficult because on the one hand, he wants to be seen as someone that is capable of maintaining order. But at the same time, he's got to explain why a 17-year-old was shot in what seems to be a very murky circumstances by a policeman. And Tom, a lot of this is also cultural. I really should stress, in Europe, this idea that the police will shoot to kill in an incident like this. It's just not standard. It is not the usual. Well, Maria, let's go from Paris back to Brussels, where you are, where all 27 EU leaders agreed to offer future security commitments to Ukraine. Of course, that comes on the heels of last weekend when we saw that mutiny erupt in Russia. How does that impact these discussions? How does that impact potential further support to Ukraine? Well, I would say not just 27, but actually 28, because uh, Mr. Stoltenberg, the head of NATO, he was here yesterday. And by the way, it is now widely expected that he is going to be renewed as the head of NATO for another year. Remember, he was supposed to leave for the Norwegian Central Bank in 2022, but then the war broke out. The idea now is that he will be extended for another year. Look, I think the fundamental issue here is not so much Russia. They say this is an internal matter. They don't want to comment on the politics. It's about Ukraine and NATO. Will the Ukraine Ukrainians want is a very clear promise from NATO next month that when the war is over, they will join NATO. Is there consensus to get that kind of promise to say, yes, you will join? Frankly, at this point, no. And this is a very delicate topic, not just here in Europe, but also in the United States and across NATO.
Well, on that topic, Maria, I mean, what's the current thinking of the likelihood that they will get that commitment next month? At this point, if I have to be very frank, I do not think there is consensus. There's a number of ideas that have been floated. Uh, President Macron himself, he said we could do something in the in between where you have something like the Israeli model where you promise weapons, guns, money, anything they need, but they don't or will not fall <coughs> into the NATO umbrella, and that is Article 5. The issue here is that Ukrainians will insist they want to see a promise now that when the war is over, they will join. They say they've fought for this, they've shed blood for this, and want to see that right. commitment now in paper. Maria, I, I, I'm not being snarky here or snide, but in a general sense, did Mr. Lukashenko of Belarus, did he have a good week? I mean, did he, does he come out of the week and the tumult of everything and say, hey, I'm in a better position? Look, I think that's an excellent question. I think that's actually the point this week in Europe. Everyone's been talking about Lukashenko. I remember at one point there was this idea that he was a puppet. This week we've seen that he is not a puppet. He's very able to get his interests uh, on the table. And at this point, he's been able to say, I am in charge of the situation in Belarus. I handle Prigozhin. And Vladimir Putin, by the way, owes me a favor. Hey, I'm Maria today. Thank you so much. In Brussels today, a lot going on. And uh, Europe and, of course, we'll conti continue to look at France, where this is France-wide. It's not just about Paris as well. Serious riots with many, many people uh, injured. Again, Maria Tadeo in Brussels. I know our Carolyn Conan in Paris following the story at, as well. We come back to the shock and awe of a bull market, and I really want to emphasize that the heritage of Bloomberg surveillance is try to remember people that actually get this right. And there's other names involved here, but, Katie, I've called the low of October the Ralph Ancampora, Ed Yardeni low, uh, low. These are two people of a certain vintage who did not know in October that we would go up 23% standard mm -hmm. poor's 500 off that low. And But you got as a lesson say, okay, let's look back and where did I get it wrong that I was stuck in triple leverage all cash mm -hmm. the third week of October and I didn't have the courage to see what was forward. I would suggest the major thing was the misguess on earnings mm -hmm. and the resiliency. I got to say, Tom, I talked to a lot of people who are still <clears throat> very much in cash, especially on a cross-asset sort of view, because that money in cash doesn't just belong to equities. And when I talk to a lot of credit folks, they say, I mean, even though you have some of the junkiest credits out there, the triple C's outperforming this year, it just they can't justify going into <clears throat> riskier parts of the market when you're getting four and a half, five percent on cash. Uh, uh, well, it's a competing here. And again, we're back to, I saw some chart last night in the zeitgeist of a one-year piece out now uh, outperforms dividend uh, growth. And the belief there is you're not going to see dividend growth that keeps up with this yield and that mm -hmm. you do a better yield here. And I really wonder what corporations do. Do they continue to apply a new regime of dividend growth one year out, two years out, three years out, and all of a sudden uh, they compete. And we'll have to see, again, going back to just values alone, you mentioned Apple earlier. Everybody, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm the only one who doesn't own it. And, <laughs> and the answer here is I got a 32 multiple on Apple trailing, and I got single-digit revenue growth, but I do have that massive profitability and free cash flow. Mm -hmm. Dividend growth only 7%, five-year dividend growth. And that's the conversation I want to have <clears throat> with a smart person. Do you have to reset valuations here? I mean, to your point, you look at Apple and you look <coughs> at this balance sheet, you look at the cash flow. Do you just put aside those valuations? You don't put them aside, but you rationalize it in a bull market and until there's a fever. And... The question is, is there a bull market fever right now? Many of the optimists would say we're nowhere near that yet. It sounds like an end of the quarter conversation. That's mm -hmm. what I'm having with Katie Greifeld. She's in for Lisa Abramowitz and John Farrell. Really interesting Friday. Stay with us on Higher Yields. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Bloomberg Surveillance, good morning, everyone. The end of the quarter. We stagger into the third quarter. Monday, program note, we'll be here. I'll be here. John Farrell will not be here. Lisa Bramowitz will not be here. Okay, are you going to be here? I'm going to be here. Okay, Katie Greifeld's going to be here. That's a good uh, and beautiful thing. And, of course, it, it's a good thing because there's so much to talk about. There's so much 
that we've gotten wrong, let's observe how much I've gotten wrong with a market check. We do that with a VIX, which screams bull market 13.43, to remind ourselves, let's call it 16 is normal, 20 is a little bit of angst, 30 is a Lehman low angst. A lot of fear out there, and the fear goes the other way right now to a quiescent 13.43 on the VIX, futures up 16, Dow futures up 96. Katie, what do you see in the bond market? In the bond market, you're looking at yields sharply <clears throat> higher. I mean, sharply is the right word. Sharply yeah. to bring it back uh, to that real yield that we were talking about. I mean, now again, you're looking at the five year real yield above 2%. I believe that's the highest <clears throat> since about 2008. We're going to have to see on that. And again, the dollar, stronger dollar yesterday was, I think, a lead uh, note as well. Right now, we're going to recalibrate on the American economy. Katie, what do we have? Well, we heard from Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic yesterday reiterating his call for keeping rates steady. We also heard from Ian Shepardson of Pantheon Macroeconomics weighing in on the Fed's path forward, writing, quote, we think the Fed is done, but a further rate hike in July cannot be ruled out. Another big increase in payrolls will trigger a hike. Either way, we expect the data by September to signal clearly that further rate hikes are unnecessary, Tom. We have to see Ian Shepardson there, always writing brilliantly for uh, Pantheon Economics, and I really want to say outstanding work on China as well. Ian Shepardson, we're recalibrating right now. We did with a third look at first quarter GDP yesterday, which came in with that convenient 2% statistic. Are we going to get the third quarter wrong as well? Well, <laughs> probably. Not least because the statisticians at the BEA kind of get it wrong at the first go around as well. I mean, remember, they take three stabs at each quarter, and then after that, they do annual benchmarks and, and revisions long into the future. So you never really know where you are in real time. That's, that's one of the problems with, with tracking the economy. We all get very excited about these GDP data, but they're really just kind of the midpoint of a quite a wide range. So for the second quarter, it looks to me like the first estimate of growth is going to be something close to where we were in Q1. But a lot of that's going to come from inventories, which won't last and probably will actually reverse. And I'm more concerned looking forward about some of the softness in, in final demand. You know, consumer discretionary spending looks like it's wobbling a little bit. And business capital <coughs> intentions and inventory intentions have absolutely rolled over. So a mixed bag. But I think net, I'm not seeing a lot of sustainable strength in the economy right now. The sustainable strength in the economy gets to the great missed call this year, which is on recession. You and I have always thought it's sort of a juvenile debate because you've got NBER, what James Paterba is doing, that definition and this one. And maybe someone like Lawrence Summers has a different definition as well. Are we going to continue the silly game of recession guessing through the rest of the year? Oh, no doubt. But it kind of misses the point, really, because does it matter if GDP growth is <clears throat> minus 0.5 or plus 0.3 or even minus 1 or plus 1, given that it's not measured to that degree of accuracy anyway? What really matters from the Fed's perspective is not the headline GDP numbers. It's what happens in the labor market and what happens to inflation. Now, unquestionably, the labor market has been stronger than I think pretty much anybody expected going back to the turn of the year. These, these payroll numbers have been kind of amazing. But I do think there's a little bit of fraying at the edges now. It, clearly, uh, the pace of layoffs is going up. You can see that in all the data. Challenger, warn notices, jobless claims, all going up. And hiring intentions in most of the surveys are going down. Now, eventually, that has to hit the payroll numbers. We cannot just keep printing these enormous payroll numbers when indicators of both hiring and firing are going in the wrong direction. So I think we're going to have a very interesting summer. But my guess is that by the end of it, we'll be looking back and saying, ah, you know, things have have softened materially, uh, both on the, on the labor market front and on the inflation front. And that sets up uh, a collision with some of those more hawkish Fed members who uh, I think are kind of missing the point of, of having done enough already. Well, Ian, how linked are those two pillars of the economy, the labor market and inflation? And in what way is that relationship flowing? Well, in, in the medium term, I'm, I'm kind of on board with the idea that, that we can't have sustained inflation at the target and sustained rapid wage growth. It's just, it's just not plausible to think that wages could carry on rising at 4 to 5% and inflation could run at 2 So I do buy the idea that the Fed has to engineer 
a loosening of the labor market. But in the short term, inflation and the labor market numbers are not quite so closely connected. And in particular, the story that we're seeing uh, about margin compression, which is very clear in the, in the producer price numbers, not so much in the CPI yet. But that story is independent of what happens in the labor market in the short term. And so is the pass through from falling oil prices, falling food prices globally, the downshift that we're finally seeing in the rate of rent increases. All these things are pretty much baked in, uh, regardless of how long it takes the Fed to slow down wage growth. But I've got to say, looking at the survey evidence, wage growth to me is likely to slow down as well. So I've got a fairly a bullish forecast for inflation, especially in the fourth quarter and into next year. And I just hope that the Fed is patient enough to wait to see this stuff coming through rather than continuing to hike using backward looking inflation numbers as a guide to forward looking policy decisions. Well, Ian, on that note, you wrote that you expect that both headline and core inflation will fall faster than the Fed expects. What's going to drive that, though? Is that that wage growth slowing down that you talked about or another factor? Well, it's partly that. You know, I do think that wage growth will be slower. I mean, I have to believe it when employers tell me that wage growth will be materially slower by the end of the year. You can see that clearly in the survey. So I do buy that story. I also think the unemployment rate is going to go up a bit as well, and that will, that will do some work as well. But margin compression still has a long, long way to run. So we've seen roughly a 25% increase in retailer and wholesaler gross markups uh, during the pandemic. Now that's peaked. It hasn't yet come down. So the rate of change has dropped pretty much to zero, but it needs to go negative. And all the things which signaled that margins were going to expand, like the huge increase in spending on goods during the pandemic and all the supply chain problems, they've all reversed. So I think it's just a matter of time before that stuff works through and pushes those margins back down and pushes mm -hmm. down uh, inflation in the goods sector. And the labor market should fix the services sector. So yeah, net, I, I'm pretty bullish that we are way past the worst of inflation and there's some good news coming. Ian, you've done brilliant on China. I remember the LinkedIn articles of years ago and what Pantheon Macroeconomics has done has just been outstanding. Can you give me some optimism on China for the second half of 2023? Yeah, I'd like to, but it's quite hard. I mean, you know, we've seen the policy response from the authorities to the, the failure to launch uh, that everybody was hoping for, you know, after the end of the zero COVID restrictions. But the fact is that, um, you know, Chinese consumers uh, you know, have picked up some of the baton, but the, the industrial sector is still pretty soft. PPI inflation is negative and probably going to go more negative, which is good for the rest of the world. It means cheaper goods prices. But the momentum in growth that I think we were all hoping to see really isn't there. Still big problems in the property market, uh, big problems in the whole industrial economy. And it's probably going to require more policy action, more stimulus, <coughs> fiscal stimulus, and probably more monetary stimulus going into Q2. They really need to hit that about 5% GDP target. And, yeah. and that probably requires more action. But I'm afraid that, that the great hopes that we all had that China would be, you know, really leading a global recovery. We're just not seeing it in China. We're not seeing it in the rest of Asia. That, that, that pull through just isn't happening. Fold that into a dollar call here with your U.S. view, with some of the struggles on margins, with what you see in China. Again, looking back the six months, a huge body of people got the weak dollar call wrong. Where do you see dollar at the end of this year? I can see it moderating a bit. You know, I, I do have a less aggressive call on the Fed uh, than the market. And, um, you know, clearly the ECB is going to hike at least twice. Bank of England is going to hike at least twice. I really hope the Fed doesn't. So uh, given that that's now pretty much priced in, that the Fed does go twice, I, that probably puts a bit of a negative spin on the dollar. But I don't think that's going to be a huge story. I'm not expecting any sort of seismic shift uh, in, uh, in developed market currencies either way over the next few months. But that, at the margin, I'd, I'd have thought the dollar by the end of the year will be a bit softer. Ian, I actually want to go back to China and talk a little bit more about the idea that we could see stimulus because we're having a conversation with Leland Miller uh, later in this program, of course, of the China Beige Book. He says that it's sort of a fake out to expect a massive stimulus package. When you think about the support that China could unleash, I mean, put that in context. What kind of magnitude are we talking about? Uh, it's not going to be very big. I mean, I just don't really detect any great appetite for any sort of large-scale fiscal stimulus. It's much more likely to be targeted to specific sectors, 
uh, and to specific regions rather than a sort of a broad free for all, you know, handing you know, checks in the mail to Chinese citizens. They're, they're very unkeen on that sort of policy approach. And their monetary approach is pretty incrementalist as well. You know, the last easing was all of 10 basis points. So I think there's a reluctance to go hell for leather. I, I think that they're more in a case of we'll do a bit and wait and see. And if we have to do a bit more later, then we'll, we'll do that as well. But, um, but we're not going to see some sort of blowout deal. I think they're, they're very nervous about just uh, throwing good money after bad, and they, they want to see organic growth developing. So, yes, they will help at the margins, and they'll provide targeted support in some sectors, but, uh, but we're not going to see a great blowout. If you extrapolate that out, what does that mean for the rest of emerging <coughs> markets? Because, okay, maybe the China rebound story, the reopening didn't exactly play out uh, to some of the bullish, uh, really, fantasies that we saw at the beginning of the year for emerging markets. But do, does the emerging markets block as a whole need a really strongly rebounding China to do well here? Well, it's better for them, for sure. I mean, it benefits the East Asian economies just through the trade flows. And you can see that one of the characteristics of China's failure to launch is the weakness of trade across the whole region. But, of course, other EMs are further away, especially in Latin America, are very contingent on what China does because of the commodity story. You know, the copper, oil, and other commodity prices are very, uh, very driven by China at the margin. So for those economies in, in Latin, it would be very helpful if China were to gather a bit of momentum. So yes, I mean, it's been disappointing for all EM, uh, for different reasons, depending <coughs> where you look. But um, moving into next year, if China can develop a bit more momentum, then that would be an uplift of the whole Asia and, and Latin space. But, but again, right now, this right. is not something I think it can rely on happening in the next few months. It's going to be much more of a grind. Ian, what we see in the next few months I'm absolutely thunderstruck at the number of people trying to buy victory in Premier League soccer, in Premier League football in England. Is <laughs> Newcastle United, your beloved Newcastle yeah. United, are they going to climb on board and start bidding a hundred kajillion dollars for all these fancy talents? Well, you know, the transfer season's in full swing now. We, we, we've just bought Italy's uh, midfield captain, so um, yeah. The money is flowing. Of course, what, what happens is the Premier League is now just a plaything for very rich states. Uh, and so the, the days of you know, local businessmen owning, owning football clubs is, are long gone. And now it's just a, a race for the petrodollars. It's all sort of <coughs> faintly absurd and, and, and rather disconcerting. But it was fun to watch Newcastle United this uh, year and to learn about the Shepherdson past. Ian Shepherdson uh, with Newcastle United and Pantheon Macroeconomics uh, with us today. And it, it just really it speaks, Katie. You know, we're, we're making jokes here about English football because I miss John Fair. I'm going to I'm going to tear <laughs> up here. I miss I miss I miss Farrow so much. I wish I had anything to add on. What soccer. the hell is it about these British people where they take like three, four weeks? You know, God bless vacation. He deserves it. We're nuts. Yeah. I mean, we're working Monday. What's that about? I'm psyched, too. That's <clears throat> You're psyched. I, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm psyched, too. But, uh, you know, you, you, you look at this, and it speaks to the resiliency. And this is the heart of the matter, folks. And really, one of the great essays of the second quarter was Lawrence McDonald writing it out. Go to his site, Bear Trap, whatever it is. But Larry McDonald absolutely nailed the first order condition, which is just the mass of money mm -hmm. that's out there. Mm -hmm. That's the number one thing we forget about. I know, and you can see that. I mean, again, it's not just necessarily a U.S. story. Of course, we have our own uh, fiscal situation. But then you look at some of the data that we got out of Europe this morning in terms of Eurozone inflation. Core inflation <coughs> for a lot of these developed economies, it's still very much a problem. Consumers are still spending. We're well, still strong. This is the tension, folks, and this is what we're going to be covering here uh, into July. It's a late jobs report for June. Usually it would be like July 2, 3, 4, a holiday gets in the way. Uh, July 7. Uh, maybe John's coming back for 4th of July because he doesn't <laughs> celebrate it. Uh, but, you know, you get to July 7 for the jobs report and then on to the earnings season. And the backdrop of this, which is to me the elephant in the June 30th room, and I'll go through the yields right now 4.91% in the two year yield. Do we go back to a 5% there? It looks likely up five basis points. 3.87% in the 10 year, 3.92% percent of 30-year bond. Are you getting used to a 7.25, 7.5, dare I say 7.9 percent 30-year mortgage? Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. We're anticipating the price to, to rise from here for oil in particular. Uh, by the end of the year, we're anticipating 
balance to go back into uh, deficit again. And we are anticipating price to go up. Our forecast right now for June of 2024, a year from now, uh, is $87 for Brent and uh, $84 for WTI. Darwin Kung, very intelligent at DWS there on the larger macro picture of, of what we see in commodities. We're going to get to oil in a business. But as we recalibrate here in equities, bonds, currencies, commodities, uh, I, I've given, I, I would say, short shrift to commodities here uh, through the year. And, and Katie Greifeld, it's just real simple. China, copper, commodities weaker. I mean, that's the summary. There's no other way to put it. Commodities weaker. But then you look at oil, and I mean, <clears throat> that's the big head scratcher. I don't know if this is a supply driven market, a demand driven market, but it seems like it's going nowhere, at least for the last couple of days. Uh, we'll have to see here with with oil. Uh, the big, It is a big well, well, the bull market's a big shock of the first six months, but mm -hmm. oil's right behind there as well. Brent crude 74.34. We've not made a dash under 70 on world oil. But on American oil, decidedly, we have sixty nine dollars, 72 cents with a visit to sixty six dollars a barrel. Everyone I speak to, led by John Tucker of Bloomberg Radio, makes clear to me that the price of gasoline has not followed a barrel of gas down. Maybe that waits for the third quarter to see a gallon of gas migrate down. Providing immense service to us on the microeconomics of supply demand of hydrocarbons has been Amrita Sen, co-founder and director of research in energy aspects. How do you recalibrate for the second half of the year, Amrita? Great question, Tom. And I think the challenge we have right now, like you were saying as well, is that it's a bit of a bifurcated market, right? <laughs> Crude has not performed as we've expected as well, but products markets have. And this is where I go back to this isn't a demand problem. If demand was weak, we wouldn't have gasoline prices at the pump uh, not having come down. Gasoline has actually done very, very well, including in China. Uh, even diesel, where uh, manufacturing has been weak, has actually started to perform very well. Overall, demand is actually holding up and demand has been coming in stronger than we've been expecting, as, as you and I have discussed as well. There has been this issue with destocking, as, as we've talked about before as well. High interest rates just mean across the board, any business, they just don't want to hold as much inventory. So we've had more crude right. come to the market as a result of that. Um, but also, I think supply. I, I do think Iran was the big miss we had. Um, we've actually raised Iranian production now. They've managed to increase production. And, you know, the interesting thing about the Iranian situation is that if the same volume of oil say came out of the United States or Saudi Arabia, <clears throat> it would actually be less bearish. But Iran discounts its oil right. to sell, right? So that brings the marginal price down. And the availability of these discounted crudes, be it Iran, Russia, I think that's been the big story. Volumetrically, I don't think we've gotten balances wrong, but I think that the availability of more discounted oil has meant that prices right. haven't reacted in the same way. Now, Marita, you and I have a shared respect for Edward Morse at Citigroup, who really looks at the geopolitics of hydrocarbons 24-7. And as you know, Ed Morse absolutely nailed the idea no oil wouldn't go to 120 and stay there, that we would visit 70 or dare I say $60 a barrel. Give us your geopolitical spectrum right now. What is the optionality Saudi Arabia has to raise oil $10 a barrel? I mean, right now, uh, given also the macro environment, I'm not expecting um, a lot in, or optionality even from a Saudi point of view to be able to raise production because Saudi Arabia has unilaterally cut production. OPEC Plus have extended their voluntary cuts. There's not much more they can do. For them, it is about providing stability to the market, provide a floor so that even when there's a lot of demand uncertainty, you still have some continued investment. The market is tightening. You can start to see it in the heavier SAR crudes, not in the lighter crudes. And this gets very, very technical. But we have a problem with NAFTA. The petrochemical sector is actually very weak. And that is, like you said at the start, it's a China problem. The property sector is very weak. And the issue we have is all our benchmarks, Brent, WTI, are light crudes, which have a lot of NAFTA cuts in it. So they, this is, it, it's a problem for the market because we look at these benchmarks to give us signals of tightness. But you can finally start to see some of this tightness come through in the heavier SAR crudes, like in Dubai. So again, the Saudi cuts, the OPEC cuts are working 
working, but I still think it's going to take a long mm -hmm. time or a while, not a long time, but at least a few more weeks before we see that tightness percolate through the rest of the complex. Well, I want to talk a little bit more about the different cross currents of the supply picture that you walked through a little bit. Of course, you do have the Iranian cut or uh, production uh, coming up, but you also have the OPEC cuts as well. When you balance it out, I mean, what's the bigger force here? The bigger force, of course, are the OPEC cuts in Saudi Arabia's unilateral one million barrels per day cut for July. Um, th th those numbers are a lot bigger. But that's why I mentioned that even if Iranian production, let's say, on average is up about 300,000 more than what we had expected, the fact that they are discounting their oil, let's say, by 15, 20, 30 dollars, whatever that number is, that makes a big difference because suddenly then Asia, which is your marginal buyer, doesn't have to buy benchmark crudes, right? It can buy cheaper Iranian Russian barrels. And that's what's weighing on prices. And if we talk specifically about the price action, you look at Brent, I think the low was around $70. You look at crude specifically, the low was around $64 set in May. Is that the bottom here or do we have the potential to see actually that level break over the next few months? My worry for the next few weeks is that we we know always this is the time when sovereign hedges happen, particularly from <coughs> Mexico. Uh, that's no secret. And it's thin liquidity. Uh, people haven't done very well this year because oil's been range bound at best, but a lot of volatility within that. Uh, so most people, most traders I know are like, OK, we, you know, we're going on holiday. We'll come back and reassess. If you get these big sovereign hedges come through, you are going to get price pressure in the coming weeks. And that could mean in a low liquidity scenario potentially lower prices but other than that other than kind of flow driven events <clears throat> i do think the floor for brent is say call it around 70 71 and the upside should be in the mid 80s so um that's the thing i'm watching for in the coming weeks is is, is those hedges being put through i'm Rita Sun. thank you so much just huge help here for the first half thank of uh, 2023 really look forward to speaking to her on the mystery of hydrocarbon forward I, and i'll say this folks which i think is widely understood on wall street it's the single toughest thing to predict i'm Rita Sun and her ilk have the toughest job uh, out there i think the, the the only research piece katie i have on my coffee table at home in the living room mm -hmm. is the jp morgan 80 page piece modeling out $120 a barrel because of emerging market demand. Forget about ESG and the rest of it. Emerging market needs hydrocarbon and up we go. Have they been wrong? Yes, mm -hmm. but give it some time. And that's sort of the hope and prayer out there for higher oil. Maybe you can lend me that book because <clears throat> it's definitely a mystery to me. And then you look at the price action just over the past few months. I was reading a story this morning, Brent Oil on track for its worst run of quarterly losses and data going yeah. back in more than three decades, <clears throat> this oil well, market has been so difficult to read. And you take Saudi Light as an older series and you adjust it for inflation and you adjust it for our rising incomes. And it's amazing how it's a, not an oil depression that's too strong, but it's really been uh, quite weak. Where well, we haven't seen that, uh, you know, looking at second quarter, Q1, going back to the Greifeld low. <laughs> In Bitcoin, what was the low in Bitcoin here? Do you take it off twenty six thousand, you know, or do you, do you where, where in your head do you say at thirty thousand we're up X? I mean, how do you do that in at thirty thousand? I say, holy moly, we're up <clears throat> a lot since we were below twenty thousand dollars. That was, of course, in October. Everything right. rebounded in October. Bitcoin uh, was no exception. There, we're still hanging tough above thirty thousand. We saw that big move uh, over right. the past two weeks. I don't know what the next catalyst, though, is. So, so the fancy names out there, the people, the crypto worships, the the the, the twins, what's their name? The, the Winklevoss twins. Yeah, and and Novogratz and the rest of them. You know, all the usual names of people out there mm -hmm. that have been big on BitDog. Have they been made whole by the move up in Bitcoin? Or are they like, come on, come on, come on, let's get to 40000 I mean, what's that mood right now? It certainly helps. But, I mean, if you think about the fact that you need <clears throat> to draw in some of the retail players that got really crushed from that move to $69,000 per coin all the way back down yeah, below 20000 I, I mean, that's, re that's really extinguished a lot of just retail interest in the space. You're left with sort of these long-term believers. So if you think about what's going to propel the next wave of excitement here, I mean, you ne really need to bring in that marginal buyer who right now still you look at the trading volume. Right. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of interest. How do you look at Bitcoin doing so well in some of our reporting today as other coins underperformed.
It's the haven currency of the <clears throat> cryptocurrency oh, God, industry. You're killing me. <laughs> she's, she's laughing. You don't see this. I mean, the Bramo cam is still on, even though Lisa's not here. Greifeld has the Bramo cam on her, <laughs> and she's <laughs> laughing at me, folks, over you. You don't understand, you idiot. It's just. <laughs> Bit it's the dog. haven currency. Bit dog is the haven currency. That's what I learned. Save me. I think the environment we are in should be that we have sticky core inflation. That sticky inflation is still the main concern. We do think that inflation will decelerate more meaningfully than the Fed is expecting. Our base case is still that the Fed probably only has one more <clears throat> interest rate hike in their pocket. What needs to happen is consumers need to feel that they might lose their jobs. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keen. It is Bloomberg Surveillance on radio, on television. Jonathan Farrell's on assignment. Lisa Bramowitz is on assignment. Katie Greifeld doesn't have a life. She's with <laughs> us today. In addition, let's get it out front right now and sell your afternoon viewing. Uh, this is an important show today because the real yield really is front and center. Greifeld holding court at the real yield. Look for that this afternoon here. Uh, and there's a lot to talk about within the fixed income space. It's part of our second quarter. How, that graphic is beautiful. It I mean, for those of you on radio, it's just a Pharaoh design that. Yeah, you know, yeah. He, I don't. That's not he me. Was, he, we're say. at the Net over. Uh, the Net is the hotel uh, next to our Queen Victoria Street shop in London. And John and I were over a beverage of our choice with Alex Webb, and he started sketching out the background. Beautiful. Of the real you. I wish you could hear the uh, theme music as well. My heart starts <clears throat> racing every time I hear well, it. Well, that's Farrell picked that out too. Yeah. I think it's a Clash song from like the like think '78 <laughs> or, or so. Right now, we're going to clash with how you got it wrong in the last six months. How I got it wrong uh, in the last Last six months. Triple leverage all cash. That really worked out. Uh, I'll say futures up 18 and the continued melt up. Dow futures up 107. Look at those levels. 44.53 rounded up. Can I say 4,500 SPX? Binkram Chata, Deutsche Bank. Good morning on that uh, statistic. 34,000 Dow. NASDAQ continues to go up. You're on a $3 trillion watch on Apple, right? You're going to mention that in the brief? Oh, big time. We're going to talk yeah. about that. That's number three, <clears throat> so I don't want to front run it. Uh, but, I mean, we'll see how these boards change at 8.30. You remember that the price action was really driven by the data we got <clears throat> yesterday and it, jobless claims and GDP. Well, this morning we have PCE coming up, a look at We inflation. have a lot of data today. A That's a summary. Of data. A lot of data. You know, get your Bloody Mary out. I yeah. know you slide into the weekend. Greifeld, 8.30. <laughs> Pay attention. Go. 8.30, PCE. <laughs> then we have personal income and spending figures, uh, a really important look at inflation in this economy. And then we have Umish sentiment. We have, of course, you know, sentiment broadly among consumers. I'm really interested to look at the inflation expectations, though. I know the Fed is as well. So we'll get those Umish numbers around 10 a.m. Also today, of course, we're on Supreme Court watch. We got the ad affirmative action decision yesterday. Now we're looking for the student loan decision. Of course, the Biden administration's plan to cancel student debt. Again, that impacts 40 million people potentially. So big ramifications there. And as Tom mentioned, of course, we are on Apple $3 trillion watch. The number to watch the closing level, we have to get to $190 80 cents. You can see we're comfortably above that. Maybe not comfortably, but firmly above <clears throat> that right now. Apple currently up that. about seven tenths of a percent in the pre market. Can I just point out that NVIDIA mm -hmm. is 1.008 trillion? It's amazing. I mean, I don't know what's more important. Uh, you know, every, who doesn't own Apple? Three trillion. Who doesn't have Apple? Like 11 products, whatever, in the house. But NVIDIA, which I really don't understand or know or get, you know, General Mills Cheerios, I get it. Yeah. Okay, NVIDIA, I don't get. It's a $1 trillion company. I don't know what to make of that. And I got to pull up the chart at some point and look at what that was a year ago because the rise of NVIDIA has just been yeah. amazing to watch, a really stunning move yeah. higher. And it seems like, I mean, you talk to a lot of people and they say that has more legs. I think Farrell was like Taleb, he had call options on it. I think that's why he's got like a six-week <laughs> That's uh, why he vacation. can take those that's vacations. Why, yeah, exactly. Tesla. Market cap, less than NVIDIA. I never thought I'd say that. 816 uh, gazillion for uh, 
Car Musk Company uh, as well. Right now, we're going to get started as you recalibrate into next year. And yes, Katie and I will be here on Monday. Hope you attend uh, as well. Tracy McMillan joins now with Wells Fargo, head of global asset allocation strategy. What's changed in your mid year recalibrate, Tracy? Good morning, Tom. Good morning, Katie. So what has changed mid-year is that we um, we have continued to be very selective in our asset class uh, selection and our sector <clears throat> selection. And in particular, you know, we have um, we have been very favorable information technology overweighting that in our equity portfolios. We've just pulled back on that, thinking that that asset class now probably a little bit overbought. We'll take some profits there. We're moving that into materials and energy, thinking that uh, commodities prices right. here at relatively <clears throat> low levels could rise as we move through the rest of this year. Okay, but this is really important, folks, because this is a sector analysis. And what you know is you pick five sectors and hope, as Wells Fargo did, you win in information. Uh, technology, in energy, that's not good enough. Are you going to buy big oil? Do you buy middle grade oil, the old Anadarkos of the day, or independence out of Texas? When you say energy, what do you actually buy? Yeah, so we're looking at the integrated oils. We're we're looking at really the um, the broad sector as a whole because we think that that underlying energy price is going to support it, and that um, supply is going to continue to be constrained, and that demand will stay relatively firm. So we see oil prices moving up to between 85 and possibly $95 a barrel by the end of the year. So we think that that really supports, um, supports oil companies across the board. Do you pair that with buying the equities as well in addition to buying the actual commodity? We do. Uh, within our portfolios, we, we look at various asset classes within equities, and we also have an asset class for commodities. Uh, so we do have a commodities position, and we are we're kind of taking that viewpoint on commodities through to our equities sector holdings as well. And within the uh, asset classes, we, we've stayed up in quality, and we continue to do that as we look to uh, the end of the year. And that's really benefited investors because it's been those higher beta parts of the equity markets, like emerging markets and small caps, that have underperformed large cap and those quality type holdings. Well, as you look towards the end of the year and as we enter the second half and you take the temperature of this market, is it still a defensive tilt or is it time to go on offense? What are you playing? Yeah, so we're staying defensive, and we do think that as we move through the rest of this year, we're going to continue to see that earnings recession that has already started. We've already had two quarters of negative earnings. We think we're going to see the third quarter of negative earnings as, as we start to get earnings results here in the next couple of weeks. And we're staying up in quality. Uh, I mentioned that before, large caps over <clears throat> the higher beta sectors within fixed income. We can continue to like quality over high yield. We just don't think the spreads right. represent the amount of risk that's there in high yield. So yes, stay defensive. What are the ramifications if we get a higher yield set? I mean, I get the theory that if you have a coupon, you get a higher yield, you're going to pick up a further coupon while price goes down. That game plays itself, Tracy, as long as you can, and then it falls apart. Is a surprise for the next six months that we get price down, yield up enough, where the carry on yield falls apart? Well, that's one reason why we're staying shorter term and we're barbelling with, with a, a short term and long term strategy and in fixed income. So we do think that uh, interest rates now are retesting a level that we saw back in March. And if you recall, when we hit these yields in the marketplace, we did start to see some disruptions. We started to see bank failures. Uh, investors have written that off as idiosyncratic. Uh, they think that you know the Fed was able to take care of that. Uh, we're not so sure. We think you know as we move up into these higher levels of yields again, we could see additional disruptions. And so you know we would stay short term 
uh, reap those 5% plus yields in, in the near term. But also, if we get up to 4% uh, in the longer term bonds, we would be buying those because we think that as the Fed pulls inflation back to 2%, that 4% yield is going to look really good in the longer term. It's going to be interesting to see. I, you know, Tracy, I, I, I look at the recalibration, and the heart of the matter is there's a lot of people out there who weren't on the seven-stock juggernaut. What do you do if you don't own those seven stocks? Do you take a minimum position? Do you just say, I have to wait for next time? What do you do with those glory stocks of the first half of 2023? Uh, a lot of those are uh, are overbought in, in our viewpoint. Um, however, uh, we would continue to purchase those higher quality names, and a lot of those names are uh, those seven stocks that have performed so well. So we would look for better entry points, but you know you you really need to be uh, in the higher quality names, and so we would. Um, you know, we would hold positions there, but not necessarily initiate them. Tracy, thank you so much. Tracy McMillan there with some real acuity from Wells Fargo Investment Institute on what to do. I think what's great there, Katie, is people talk about 60,000 feet, you know, economy. It's like bank CEOs where they go, what do you think the economy is going to do? <laughs> do I really care? And with asset allocators, it's like 60-40. And what you heard there from Ms. McMillan was the real acuity of saying, Okay, we're going to lighten up on tech, mm -hmm. and I think we're going to go long energy, and then it's the, okay, how do you affect that? And mm -hmm. that's the hard part. Yeah, and how do you affect that, again, across assets? <clears throat> I really uh, enjoy talking to people who mul or manage a multitude of assets because that's a two-sided trade. I mean, you can do it through the <clears throat> actual commodity market. You can do it yeah. through energy stocks. We know that there's been a bit of a divergence between those two, especially last year, but it's an interesting bet. And what's interesting here, and we do this with the death of Harry Markowitz, who basically invented everything we talk about every day, the laureate dying this week at 95 of course, uh, one of the forces of the University of California at San Diego. And Markowitz w would, would say, you got to diversify. And yet I was thunderstruck in the Brian Murphy obituary in the Washington Post, how he said, I wish I owned more stocks when I was 25. There you go. And that's a huge deal from this Nobel laureate that he would have said that yeah. a couple of years ago. I wish that I'd own more stocks. You're going to hear that a lot. Uh, a theme, to say the least. Uh, futures up 17. The Standard & Poor's 500 up a lofty four-tenths of a percent. We say good morning to all of you. Bloomberg Surveillance on radio, on television. Uh, just lots to talk about. And I want to talk right now about an absolutely momentous day. For those of you younger, this is not a big deal. You can take it back to your viewing of Mary Poppins a few years ago. I think the movie came out, I'm guessing, in 1966, and you think, Katie, in the, in, the, in the great bank scene there, David Tomlinson and Dick Van Dyke as the elderly banker, that LIBOR was in play. Mm -hmm. You know, they were doing LIBOR uh, when they were doing railways to India. LIBOR is actually pretty recent. It's back to the 1970s or so. And we're seeing now the end of LIBOR. Bloomberg reporting here that the final LIBOR fiction, fixings in Europe, they wear tuxedos for this, <laughs> published you know, overnight. And these are the different tenors. This is one of the most famous charts in the history of modern Wall Street. Uh, I have huge pride that the team Bloomberg Surveillance lived this from 06, 07. I had the clearest memories of going back and forth on the day this blew up in August 07 with a leading firm CFO. We we're talking about four standard deviation moves in LIBOR OIS. This is pure LIBOR, the three-month, 90-day fix. The huge calm as it came down after Lehman, after Bear Stearns, was flat. Some of the angst of the last decade. And then with this pandemic, folks, the absolute surge in short-term interest rates. Stay with us with the end of LIBOR because we have a jewel in this company, Ira Jersey and his team and Bloomberg Intelligence, and they will help you with the new LIBOR, which is SOFR. I think I'm pronouncing it's that right. SOFR. Did I do okay there? That sounded good. S-O-F-R is what it is. LIBOR, the final days of LIBOR. Extraordinary. This is Bloomberg. Good morning.
discrimination still exists in America. Today's decision does not change that. It's a simple fact. If a student has, has overcome, had to overcome adversity on their path to education, college should recognize and value that. The court has effectively ended affirmative action in college admissions. And I strongly, strongly disagree with the court's decision because affirmative action is so misunderstood. The President of the United States, Joe Biden, there on fire yesterday over the controversy of affirmative action and the statement of a 6-3 to three Supreme Court. Full disclosure, I should note that Michael Bloomberg published on this for Bloomberg Opinion uh, yesterday, very much in support of the tone there you heard from President uh, Biden. Mr. Bloomberg is a majority owner of Bloomberg LP, which uh, not only keeps me and Katie Greifeld moving forward, but also Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg Radio. Catherine Greifeld is in for Lisa Abramowitz and John Farrell uh, this morning. We'll be here Monday. Hope you're with us, uh, too. And to dive into this debate and do it in a Bloomberg surveillance fashion, we can go to Anne-Marie Horton, who's our Bloomberg Affirmative Action correspondent. Anne-Marie, you brilliantly lay out, is reported uh, across the news organizations, of a footnote that Justice Roberts wrote that West Point, Annapolis, and Colorado Springs are different. They're going to have affirmative action, but any given school is not? Yes, there's this carve-out, if you want to call it, for military academies to continue using um, <clears throat> affirmative action, race-based, conscious program admissions uh, provisions in these military academies. And the president made a nod to that, and he didn't quite connect the dots, but was saying we have, you know, our military is the envy of the world. and. The justices are allowing the military universities to do this. Of course, this is because uh, the military wants to make sure that they have diverse officers, not just individuals on the front lines, and, and uh, <clears throat> but they want diverse officers, and that's really where this stems from. Um, you know, there's going to be some <clears throat> criticism by the fact that there are still officers that are in the U.S. military that don't come from military universities. You think of ROTC programs on campuses. So uh, a tremendous amount of pushback, obviously, from this White House right. and <clears throat> the Democratic Party. But also, that was an interesting carve-out and footnote of this uh, s Supreme Court decision. Emory, I think for this decision, and of course for our international audience, this is a modest uproar across this nation uh, this morning. Rather than do the rehash of everything that's out there, I want to focus on one small vignette out of this. And, and thank you to Abby Van Sickle, who I thought was brilliant on this in the New York Times. There are two black Supreme Court justices. To be polite, they don't disagree. Can we say that about a broad Latino and black community in America, Anne-Marie? I think for the most part, what you saw from the black community, Latino community, um, the individuals like the head of the NAACP <clears throat> is that they firmly agree with the liberal uh, wing of the Supreme Court, that this should not have been struck down, that this just negates decades of president in the United States um, to make sure that when you are applying for college admission that university campuses are doing their best <clears throat> to try to make sure that they have a diverse body. Coming out of this is, of course, everyone watching this decision yesterday. We know that universities have already have been ramping up and gearing up for potentially having to go back, tweak, revamp their admission processes. But also, um, some of the legal experts we were speaking to last night on Balance of Power are talking about the fact that this just opens up a can of worms for not just universities, but everything else, especially businesses and uh, a corporate right. America. And Katie, the, 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 as it was with any major decision down the road, it's going to be extraordinary. But the partition here from Clarence Thomas to Katanji Brown Jackson is absolutely extraordinary in the in the the anger of the language the acuity of the anger is something I'm not quite sure I've ever seen before really back 50 60 years and this was broadly expected but uh, you're right in that reading uh, what these justices had to say was really stunning and Anne Marie you mentioned that you know this doesn't just affect university this this ex impacts businesses as well and if you look at some of the response I mean for one you had the HR Policy Association basically file a friend of the court brief saying that uh, its members rely heavily on on colleges. What does this mean for the pipeline of talent going into corporate America when it comes to diversity? 
Well, I think there's one thing we also should note and a nuance in this is that affirmative action as we know it has essentially been abolished by yesterday's Supreme Court ruling when it comes to universities. But there are other ways universities can make sure they are still recruiting from diverse backgrounds, especially back black Americans, Hispanic Americans. Um, there, you know, in the opinion, they did talk about the fact that students could talk about um, race in their essay and how that has impacted them. Uh, but it does bode a question of you know, what does this mean as all of these diversity programs have been set up for years and decades regarding this. And companies also, like universities, want diverse talents because diverse groups, many think, obviously bring diverse thinking, diverse workforce um, into a company. And what legal experts are saying is that potentially we could see more of this. And you already see in a lot of red states them really trying to crack down on any sort of DEI measures that corporate America is using or universities are using. And it's just going to get harder for corporate America to really navigate state by state what is allowed when it becomes to diversity, inclusion, um, and even things like the environment, et cetera. A lot of work ahead for universities and for corporations, to your point. But let's talk a little bit more about President Biden's response, because speaking after the decision yesterday, he said that we cannot let this decision be the last word. But what options, what can the Biden administration do here? Well, they're pointing to the Department of Education, but there's really a not a lot they can do unless, of course, they were able to get Congress on board. Um, the other thing they could do, which the president then said in an MSNBC interview that he would not do, is, of course, potentially try to stack the court, add more justices. And he said that would be a mistake. Um, but the president did call this current makeup of the court, which yesterday on ideology lines, you saw the six to three and then the six to two on the Harvard case because Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson recused herself, is you see what he is calling a not normal court. Um, but this is going to be a huge debate going into 2024. Um, we saw a lot of outcry right. yesterday about affirmative action, but many are pointing yeah. to the fact that Democrats were able to really uh, keep their majority in the Senate, even pick up a seat, and there wasn't a mm -hmm. wet rave in the House because of abortion as well. And then today we're going to get student loans and potentially affirmative action decision, uh, excuse me, a LGBTQ decision as well. Emery, one final question, and, and this is just because you're so well re read on the American political experience. Do people vote in a presidential election because of their beliefs of Supreme Court dynamics? Does it really matter inside the voting booth or the write-in ballot? I think it depends on what the Supreme Court decision is. We've seen the Democrats were not only able to campaign aggressively on striking down of Roe v. Wade and the Dobbs decision, but that that likely saved them from a red wave when they were Democrats and the White House were dealing with very high inflation because abortion really matters, especially to those independent women voters. And when you ask Republican presidential nominees what they're going to do regarding abortion, it's a difficult topic for them to answer because they know they do not want to ostracize the middle of society. Will individuals go out and vote on affirmative action? Potentially, this could be an issue for the youth vote that the Democrats really want to pick up. Amory Horton, thank you so much, our chief Washington uh, correspondent. And again, Katie, I guess, I guess, you know, I mean, the Supreme Court day starts like your day, 10 a.m., right? Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. they get going about 10 a.m., right? Yeah, that's uh, the, the time that we're looking for. My understanding is it doesn't necessarily have to come at 10 a.m., but that's when really uh, the Supreme Court watch starts. And as Anne-Marie brought up, I mean, it's not just student loans. We do have that free speech and gay marriage ruling expected today. So uh, it's a hefty day for the Supreme Court heading into this holiday weekend, you could call it. I think you could call it a holiday weekend. Let's not forget that people like to bury bad corporate news late on a Friday into a holiday weekend. It is not a holiday Monday. Believe it or not, July 3 markets are open. They came to me and Katie months ago, I think it was seven months ago, and said, you know, we'll give you the month of August off into the first <laughs> week of September if you do July 3rd. We'll be here Monday. Hope you're with us as well. It's a bull market. Futures up 16. Bloomberg surveillance.
Equities, bonds, currencies, commodities are Fridays before 4th of July weekend. You are riveted to the markets, and we're thrilled that you're here. Bramo, Farrow, gone. Greifeld in. Plus, Katie Greifeld will be on The Real Yield this afternoon, which is well-timed. She had a start to interim and said, I'm not doing it unless The Real Yield moves. <laughs> it's moved. And on the screen, 80-90 statistics, uh, uh, Catherine, I'm looking at The Real Yield, 1.66%. This is a changed landscape. And to break out, I don't know where the level is, 1.70, 1.71 is a ginormous deal for the stock market. You think it would be. I mean, you remember back when the 10-year real yield was negative 1%. Everyone was saying that's going to keep this bid into growth going. Now you look at where it is now and that bid for growth stocks, it's still there. So we'll see. But really interesting moves along the curve, especially in the belly. If you look at the five-year, I mean, I had talked to a lot of bulls on the Treasury curve, that middle point, and uh, it looks like it's not working out, at least for today. Well, at least for today. And the question is, is, is do you see the high yields of the two year dissipate or do you see the high yields of the two year migrate out to a new higher yield of the five year that's a raging debate just on the data right now two year yield 4.91 percent officially i'm on a five percent watch on the two year we've been there but just for a cup of coffee <laughs> uh 10 year yield 3.87 percent 30 year bond on that mortgage space 3.91 percent uh, the 30-year mortgage has not breached up through new tension. There's a raging debate about what all this bond babble does uh, to housing. Ian Shepardson, who was on, he's pretty negative about it. He says that, you know, there could be a real impact on the housing market. Yeah, you would expect there to be. And uh, <clears throat> we'll see how that actually filters through, whether the housing market truly has bottomed or where we head from here? Well, there's a resiliency to it. We saw that yesterday in that third look at a GDP. In one hour, a raft, I say a Seattle slew of economic uh, data. On the equity markets, and of course she starts where I should be. Pharaoh is lecturing me. <laughs> he sent me a note from his third island in Italy. And he says, Tom, you got to splash in with the fam and save more. <laughs> So I booked a Carnival Cruise. That's where I'm going, and you've got an update on the stock. That's amazing. He said that. No he kidding. did. Splash in with a fan. I'm going to believe Let's you. Go. Let's talk about Carnival, though, because uh, it's definitely cruising higher in the pre-market. It got upgraded to a buy at Jefferies. It has a new street high for its price target. <clears throat> uh, Jefferies bumping it up, I believe, to $25 from nine dollars so a big upgrade there the reason why they're really uh thrilled with josh weinstein's performance so far he is the new ceo he took yeah. over last august they say that he's had a real positive effect so far when you look at the sales boost when you look at the marketing efforts so that's helping carnival out this morning up about three percent not having a great day <clears throat> is know. nike of course. Well, no, wait, wait, wait. We oh, got oh, okay. to stay in carnival here. Come on, <laughs> okay, folks. This right. is important. I haven't had a vacation since Christmas. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're looking at a four day Western Caribbean from Miami, Florida, from 244. You sit by the engine room for that. Yeah. From 244, average per person, two person rooms. I mean, this is not Round Hill in Jamaica. This is like, this is, people love this stuff. You're not getting right? me on that boat. Have you ever been on a cruise? No, no. no. Don't trust the ocean. But mm. in any Cruises, case. Okay. I yeah. Mean, I mean, a lot of people <clears throat> do love cruises, and you've seen the travel stocks do really well. It's not just the airlines. It's the cruises as well. Should we move a tough on? Tough travel weekend. Let's move on. But okay. See how she said that Bramo just would have moved on. <laughs> Katie's like, shall we move on? Shall we move on? Let's talk about Nike. They reported after the bell sure. yesterday, down 3% or so pre-market the quarterly profit just missed expectations but of course it was the outlook that investors aren't too pleased with full year revenue for fiscal 2024 expected to grow in mid single digits according to its cfo analysts were projecting growth close to six percent so a little bit of a disappointment mm. there uh, and you can see that in the shares i also want to talk about you apple apple in the brain i mean Continue. it's just it's the story of the morning we are on three trillion watch uh again currently where it's trading in the pre-market we're already there for its market cap but yeah. really the news that caught my mm. eye this morning was you got it got an a new buy rating from City. This is amazing. They say that Apple has another 30% upside. This is a stock, obviously, uh, closing in on a record market cap. And City says that Apple's ability to expand its margins is underestimated. Just really staggering. You know, and what's important here, I can't remember if folks have made a banner up for this, but we're on a $3 trillion valuation. And you say as the juggernaut, 
when is $4 trillion, as Dan Ivett Wedbush has talked about? Mm -hmm. I did the math this morning. You can do this on the Bloomberg Professional Service, folks. And I was shocked how soon on the trend of Apple of the last decade, if you extrapolate that trend out, where do you think we get to $4 trillion? Thanksgiving next year. Thanksgiving 2024. Like, yeah, like literally like in 17 months or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Thank, we're watching the Detroit Lions with Michael Barr and Thanksgiving, and we're looking at Apple as a $4 trillion stock. That I had no idea it would be that soon. Yeah. I mean, we'll see. Trend lines <clears throat> don't always hold, but, I mean, you just look at the performance of Apple. Obviously, it's blown away a lot of skeptics who have said there's already a lot of good news in this price. Shall we move on? Shall we move on? Shall we go to <clears throat> the bond market? I think we should. I think we should right now. There's a big debate out there kicked off by Bill Dudley calling for the possibility of the 10-year Treasury yield hitting 4 and a half percent. Then you have Subhadra Rajapa on the other side of Sokjan writing, quote, that we expect yields to gradually decline over the coming year as we retain our call for a 3.25 percent 10 year Treasury yield by year end. The yield curve should <coughs> gradually steepen, turning modestly positive next year as the Fed lowers policy rates in a recessionary context. Subhadra Rajapa joins us right now. My head is spinning here on equities and even more so on bonds as well. Subhadra, the fact is a lot of yields are moving up here. I'm looking at the 10-year real yield in the U.S., and it is sobering. What are the ramifications to you and SockGen if we see the 10-year real yield break out to new highs? Well, I think that the impact is going to be felt not just in the bond market, but broadly speaking, in all risky assets, right? We're starting to recalibrate to a much uh, stronger economy, but a lot of the data that we're looking at, like the first quarter GDP, the second take or third take, is backward-looking, right? So we have to be looking at forward-looking indicators. And if, we are, if the Fed were to raise rates by uh, 50 basis points or, or more, then I think that you're going to see that feed through even more sharply into the broader economy. So the forward-looking data has the potential to be meaningfully weaker if the Fed you know, continues to hike rates. I mean, our call is that the Fed would probably stay in and around you know, the, the at current levels for the remainder of the year, year it's, it's not out of the question that they raise rates by maybe 25 basis points uh, or even 50 basis points by the end of the year. But, you know, that's only going to really bring the recession, um, you know, forward, if you will. Uh, we have a recession penciled in for the first half of 2024. Uh, that still seems like the, the, the timeline that we're looking at. But broadly speaking, I think a lot of the data that we're, we're placing our optimism on is right. backward-looking, not forward-looking. Well, it's so important here, the dynamics. Katie Greifeld mentioned earlier the belly of the curve. Let's come in tight, not five to seven years, but in that interesting two-year to five-year space. What is your belief that we'll see there? Do the high yields of a two-year, one-year space come out to high yields of a four-year, five-year space, or do we get relief? I think that a lot of the, the repricing in the Fed funds market is going to be very much a front-end phenomena. That's part of the reason why we don't really think that the 10-year uh, meaningfully rises above 4%. I think we get close to 4%. It's going to be a buying opportunity for bond investors that missed their first opportunity earlier on this year uh, to go long bonds. Uh, but again, it, this, you know, the rise in yields, at least in my view, is going to be much more of a, of a, of a front-end phenomena and not a, a long-end phenomena. And you're looking at the yield curve, you know, the two cents part of the yield curve is back near negative 100 basis points or, or below. Again, that, may, that might be our opportunity to think about you know, reinitiating uh, steepeners uh, in the bond market because eventually the more the Fed hikes, uh, the more the slowdown is going to be and the Fed's going to have to uh, perhaps adjust policy uh, during uh, 2024. Subhadra, I am so excited to talk to you about that twos tens curve. Over 100 basis points inverted. And you say that you expect the yield curve to gradually steepen. And that language masks a huge call. Because if you expect the 10-year yield to sort of drop and then stay there, what does the front end look like? How much do two-year yields have to plummet? And how much does the Fed have to cut to get there? So that's really a tricky question. I think it's it's fair to say that the Fed could keep policy stable after getting to 
uh, a certain level. But beyond that, I think that the Fed is very committed to keeping policy higher for longer. And this time around, with inflation, not just a U.S. phenomena, but a global phenomena, I think that global central banks are going to keep policy restrictive well into the first half of next year. So in that sort of context, it makes sense that the front end remains sticky and you don't really see that dramatic repricing lower in the two-year uh, part of the yield curve. That's why we're calling for a very gradual re-steepening of the, of the yield curve. Typically, when the Fed pauses you know, six months after that, you tend to see the two cents part of the curve steepen out meaningfully. This time around, that process is going to be somewhat gradual. Also, for the 10-year, we only have the tens getting to, say, three and a quarter by the end of the, of the year. That's not a meaningful decline from, from where we were uh, at the lows of this year in, in tens. Again, the, the decline in yields is going to be much more gradual across the curve. Uh, in this cycle as opposed to in past cycles. So what gets us back to positive territory on the twos tens curve? If you have the two-year kind of anchored, I mean, what has to happen then at the back half? So the, the, we will, I think, eventually get to positive territory, um, but it's going to be perhaps in, in 2024 and not in 2023. We have the two cents part of the curve, uh, you know, steepening out, but you know, getting to only any, anywhere between, say, negative 50 to negative 25 basis points, you know, by the end of the year. So the, the steepening is going to be, uh, you know, much more uh, gradual. But but broadly speaking, you look at the, uh, the the broader economy, you are going to start seeing the market respond to higher interest rates. Uh, we did see some improvement in the housing market in the in the last uh, couple of months. Uh, if you start seeing two start, you know, 10 years starting to get towards uh, 4% again, and mortgage rates start to rise, you're going to see that uh, impacting the housing market. And the broader interest rate sensitive right. sectors of the economy are going to respond to higher interest rates. Subrata, thank you for the brief. Really look forward to talking to you into 2023 here on the dynamics of fixed income. Subrata Rajapa uh, with SockGen. Futures up 15 right now. Uh, <laughs> NASDAQ, I'm going to say led by Apple, to be honest. I'm making it up. I haven't uh, look, but Katie's been beating me to death with the Apple Watch <laughs> all morning. $3 trillion. Standard Poor's 500 up, three-tenths of a percent. We say good morning to all of you. Bloomberg Surveillance on radio, on television. Katie Greifeld in for Lisa Abramowitz and John Farrow. They're going to be back. I, I, Bramow, I think it's back like like the 15th or, so, or whatever. Perhaps. And Farrow, you know, he, he wants to get back for the opening of Premier League, which I think is like August 20. But we'll have to see on that as well. You know, you've got the real yield this afternoon. We're making jokes about it, but let's mm -hmm. let's discuss this, folks. It's important. Uh, Amy, if you could give me the Bill Dudley quote from yesterday. How do you make up a guesstimate on a 10-year yield? You make it up in terms of pieces. And, of course, the Ph.D. from Berkeley absolutely nails this in his critical essay yesterday. I'm going to read this in its entirety for radio. Suppose the Federal Reserve short-term interest rate target adjusted for inflation, the real yield, averages about 1% over the next 10 years. Inflation averages 2.5%. I think we can agree on that. And the bond risk premium, which is the noise out there of risk, is one percentage point. Well, you sum that up and you get 1 plus 2.5 plus 1, and then you waltz yourself out to 4.5%. That's not outlandish is what Dr. Dudley was saying. And yet he is far outside of consensus yeah. on this. Really an outlier call. Great note from Torsten Slock from Apollo uh, in the inbox this morning. He's looking at the consensus, the 10-year rate versus the 10-year rate forecast from the Fed survey of professional <clears throat> forecasters. And consensus says that 10 going to fall to 3.5%. Again, a full percentage point below. Huge difference. Yeah. Ginormous. Call. Nailed that. Up, up, uh, futures up 16. Dow futures up 89 uh, as well. NASDAQ, give me a level there, 15,172. Again, thank you, Emery, to send for wisdom this morning. Oil, 69.92 on American oil. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. If I like cash at these levels, what companies have cash and what companies can actually take advantage of that cash number? And it is big tech. You know, they have they have uh, a lot of uh, ability to manage their balance sheet the way other companies can't. And I think that does give them an advantage.
Marvin Lowe of State Street on fire yesterday with some enthusiasm here, looking forward into the second half of 2023. What are you going to do on year 6040, year 7030, year 5050, or whatever? Maybe you're all in cash, triple leverage, all cash fund. Marvin Lowe there with some real ideas about the allocation uh, for it as well. Our next guest is so important. I'm going to get right to it. We've got equity. we got a lift today on a Friday, June 30th. What do you do? You're behind. you got to buy stocks on June 30 if you're going to try to catch up uh, in your underperformance. I have a bit dog i got to do for Katie. 30, uh, 31,000. Let's round it up as there well. You go. That's what we do on Bloomberg uh, Surveillance. Catherine Greifeld is in for Lisa Bramwitz and John Farrell. Killing it here in the early morning. Katie, what do you got? I want to talk about Apple because you look at the pre-market action up eight tenths of a percent, currently above that three trillion dollar valuation. We'll see if that holds. And even still, with the amazing rally that we've seen this year, you have Citi initiating coverage with a buy rating and a two hundred forty dollar price target, saying that the stock has room to rally another 30 percent. The analyst there wrote that Apple is navigating the macro slowdown and inflationary pressure on consumer spending by consistently gaining share from Android phones. We believe the street is underestimating continued gross margin expansion. The margin expansion is important to me, but also this word, and this isn't a securities analysis of it, Katie, it's the ecosystem. Mm. How many AirPods are under the Greifeld couch at home? <laughs> so many. So many. My mom's walking around with just one <clears throat> because they're impossible to keep track of. We decided to go to the only man in America from sea to shining sea that has not lost the family AirPods. Tom Forty joins us right now of D.A. Davidson. And what's important with this conversation, folks, is Forty's expert on the chips, the wiring, and all that, but he's not a fanboy. You're neutral on Apple. Discuss. All right, I am neutral. I think that a lot of the good news is already priced into the stock. So when you think about the March to $3 trillion, it's mainly been on the back of the iPhone. The iPhone continues to perform very well. But when you think of the next trillion and you think of Vision Pro and augmented reality and virtual reality, there are a lot of structural challenges even for Apple, uh, starting with price, $34.99 is not going to result in a mass-produced, mass-marketed, mass-adopted item. And Tom, I wish I could tell you that I haven't washed many AirPods <laughs> with my washer dryer. Uh, well, there are that, many AirPods in the Forte household. Yeah, Cook and Lucas are working on that uh, right now. Tom, everybody owns it, but I continue to read from pros like you that Apple is institutionally underowned. On June 30, is long only buy side out there going, ah, oh, damn it, I got to buy it? All right, so to that point, I think that's a fair yes. And outside of Warren Buffett, uh, where it's his number one position, uh, yes, it's probably underowned from an institutional standpoint. If you look at the uh, <clears throat> basis points holdings versus the index, uh, there are likely a lot of equal weights or some underweights out there, and that's going to negatively affect their performance for the June quarter. And, Tom, I want to talk about the next trillion dollars. I mean, you have a neutral rating on the stock. It seems like you would say, take a breather here. But what's going to propel the next trillion? Is that the Vision Pro? Yes. Although, and I would have told you that it was the Vision Pro and, at some point, the Apple car. But <clears> now I have concerns that if they make a car... They're going to price it at 200000 So I think that, you know, the good news is that the iPhone keeps on chugging along, and that's still the most important product right now, generates the largest percentage of sales and profits, and it's still well positioned. But I think to go from three to four, three to five, three to six, uh, we're going to have to see some sort of contribution from the Vision Pro, potentially a car, uh, new products, uh, and I think that's going to be challenging. Can we talk about the price tag on the Vision Pro? Because when they announced that, there was a clip that made its way through social media of people gasping at that price town tag. $3,499 uh, for that augmented reality headset. Is that <clears throat> price going to have to come down? So the, the, the answer is yes. The question is, did Apple tip off their strategy by naming it the Vision Pro? So are they going to have a lower price point AR VR headset called the Vision, not unlike they do with their laptops? And I think that's a possibility. But I do think even for Apple to generate mass adoption, they're going to have to have a lower priced offering 
Uh, the good news is for Meta platforms, they're $3,000 less. So I do think to the extent that Apple gets people excited about AR, VR, uh, that could lean people to purchase the products from Meta platforms, which has one at $499. And Tom, I know you're neutral, but I want to bring you the bull case, of course, again, that city call getting a lot of attention, initiating coverage with a buy yeah, what do they know? and talking about <laughs> this underestimation of Apple's ability to really protect and grow its margins. How are you thinking about Apple's abilities when it comes to its margins? So the story for Apple uh, under Tim Cook has been the rollout of higher margin services, which has resulted in a higher multiple for the stock. Now, what the analyst isn't pointing out is that on a short-term basis, we've seen pressure in the services revenue. We've seen pressure in the advertising revenue. So yes, iPhone sales have held up amazingly well in a global challenging macroeconomic environment, but the higher margin, higher multiple causing services revenue has been right. under pressure. So I think that's a little optimistic over the next 12 months. Okay, Tom, I want to fold this into the share buyback and the belief that they're going to show up every day and buy 422 shares uh, in an odd lot from Fidelity.com. Tom Forte, I got free cash flow out at $111 billion, basically a double pre-COVID. I've got the margin discussion that Uber bulls like Ives and, and Malik over at Citigroup are, are talking about. And critically, Tom, I've got Apple with 4.1% of capital is debt. Can't these guys just keep going out and doing bond deals and buying back share after share after share? They certainly are a cash register and generate tremendous free cash flow. And yes, if Warren Buffett's not buying the stock, <coughs> uh, Apple's certainly buying the stock. And we'll see about those institutional investors, Tom, uh, to see if they want to ramp their portfolio to at least equal weight. Are they de minimis? I mean, are they going to come back and buy back so much shares? Is, to, is, is Tim Cook going to privatize AAPL? Maybe not privatize, but it does remind me of another Warren Buffett investment being Dairy Queen, uh, where there was an extended period of time where Dairy Queen had no new unit growth, but essentially bought back half its stock. So I do think there's a potential that, given the free cash flow Apple generates and that it is a cash register, <clears throat> they're going to retire a lot more shares. Privatize, I don't think so. And there, folks, in the history of Bloomberg surveillance is the first time we've taken the mother of all blue chip stocks and compared it to Dairy Queen. <laughs> Tom Forty, thank you so much. With D.A. Davidson, hugely, hugely valuable with a neutral rating on Apple. And, and this is extraordinary. You know, we, we get a lot of criticism that we only talk to fanboys. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, what's interesting about Dan Ives, he's a fanboy. Yeah, I'll, he'd admit that. But he's an informed fanboy. It's not just Apple, OMG, let's buy the new toy. But there's a guy who's saying, okay, enough. It's up 40%. You had the number. Mm -hmm. And there it is. Now what? Yeah. And that's, of course, been the way it's been for 15 years with this wonder stock. 46% on Apple, to be specific. And, I mean, it's a really <clears throat> interesting question when it comes to the institutional side. Is it underowned? What is the next leg for Apple? What's the next trillion dollars outside of just the fundamentals when you think about the product set that they're introducing? It goes back to index and, and active management, and folks. And Bloomberg reports today an important article, uh, I believe, from Bloomberg that's, that's out on PIMCO having shortfalls in, in, with Allianz, a conversation with Allianz in Europe about PIMCO having trouble bringing in funds. That's that was huge, fascinating. Huge, yeah, huge active management pressure. And equity, I would suggest, is less talked about, but even worse. And I'm sorry, it's June 30, but from a long-only buy side where I've missed the October low bull market up 23%, if I'm up 7% and not up 23, is my window dressing of October 24th going to be done on July 3rd mm -hmm. when you and I are the only two working on Wall Street. <laughs> I mean, are they, are they going to be out wherever the summer place is going? Can we get 100,000 shares of, of that? You mean you the know? active managers working <clears throat> on Monday? Right now, the state of Wall... We talked about this at dinner last night. Right now, on Wall Street, globally, and particularly in America, nobody's not working this weekend. Mm -hmm. Every, I don't care what they say. They can, you know, be having a lobster roll out in the Hamptons. Baloney. Everybody on Wall Street, Chanel Bassick mm -hmm. has been reported on this. It's a mess out there. Have a fun weekend while Greifeld and I are working. <laughs>
even if there's a recession, I don't expect a massive rebound upwards. There is going to be a massive discretionary spending headwind come September. Mm -hmm. If consumers really believe something bad is going to happen, which our indicators keep saying, then that will help slow the economy and thereby inflation. We do think that fiscal policy has been supportive of activity, probably keeping inflation elevated. That sticky inflation is still the main concern. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, and Tom Keen on a Friday, a big Friday, June 30, last day of second quarter. You didn't profit, I didn't profit. Catherine Greifeld nailed this bull market coming out of October. We're celebrating with Katie Greifeld because Bramo's off, Pharaoh's off, scheduled return sometime in August. Katie Greifeld here, and she's doing double duty today. Look for Katie Greifeld here in this final hour of surveillance. Are, are you doing the 9 a.m. as well? Uh, I've got two, two hits, two hits, not anchoring. A little bit. That's Matt Miller. Okay, she's going to make a show up here, and the bearded one will be with you at 9 o'clock. And importantly, Greifeld has a lead statistic of the day. I love this quote. Doug Cass, thank you so much for talking to us yesterday about the Yankees' perfect game and his and my memories of Vin Scully and one S. Koufax in 1965 with a perfect game. Cass sends along the brilliance of one Peter Bookvar. Outside of a few days in early March, the U.S. two-year yield is kissing the highest level in 16 years. And that folds right into your discussion this afternoon, Katie, with a real yield. Basically that, I mean, you keep underestimating the Fed. This market has kept underestimating the Fed in terms of their conviction and they're really going to get inflation under control. They're going to hike until they get there and they're going to hold which is the important piece of that puzzle. And now we are, of course, on 5% watch. But you talk about those couple of days in, Mark, in March, definitely left a hole in the long-term chart. We're going to do the equity uh, chat here in a minute with Sam Stovall. So I'm going to get the data out of the way here. And then we're going to do a made-up brief with Katie Greifeld. <laughs> I'm going to walk right through it here. And I do this in honor of the last day of LIBOR. Four-week T-bill, 5.04%. Three-month T-bill, LIBOR equivalent, 5.32%. Could you imagine a 6% a LIBOR or SOFR. We'll talk to Ira Jersey about that two year. I'm on the 5% watch, 4.91%, 10 year yield, 3.87%, and good real estate looking this weekend, 3.92% on a 30 year bond. I don't know how to calibrate a 30 year mortgage. Are we talking 3 4, a 7 4? It's seven, difficult. Six. Yeah. I, I, you know, 8%. I don't know. Yeah. I would uh, pay <clears throat> someone to do that math. But either way, it's it's hairy. Brief here. I want to go to Apple and the fixation on seven stocks. Can you imagine if they just continue to outperform and be discreet? Nobody's calling for that. Even the bulls. In Apple? Apple, NVIDIA, Tesla, all the rest of them, all the ones I didn't own. Well, you do have City saying we could get another 30 percent on Apple. We'll see if they outperform, though. Of course, the leadership discussion has been under a big debate, whether it's going to be continue to be yeah. tech or whether you're going to see some of those laggards catch up. Greifeld driving the market higher here. SPX up four tenths of a percent right now. You need to recalibrate. We need to recalibrate. And we're going to do it now with the Bible. The Bible, long ago, it would be in your office on the floor and you'd trip over it once every 90 days and fall flat. You'd have a cigar in your hand. You'd fall over the value line. If you weren't reading value line, you were reading the S&P Outlook, looking at three-star, four-star, and five-star stocks. And they have stood the test of time with CFRA, Chief Investment Strategist, Sam Stovall. Sam, how did the five-star stocks do in an SPX up 23% market? Hey, Tom, good to talk to you. Uh, well, a lot of the five stars have done very well. We've had an overweight <laughs> recommendation on a lot of those sectors that were uh, dramatic underperformers in 2022. And you know the old saying, uh, investors tend to rotate from first to worst, meaning that they move out of the defensive areas that held up best in a down market and gravitate toward those sectors like communication services, commu uh, consumer discretionary, and tech. Uh, because they were the dramatic underperformers mm -hmm. in 22 and are doing quite well in 23. The hallmark, Sam, of what you do, and I think of Gina Martin Adams leading our equity coverage at Bloomberg Intelligence as well, is you have to be in the market. So we have a boom off the October low. I'm calling it the Ancompora Yardeni low. You know those two, uh, Sam Stovall. And the answer here 
is then there's a second leg. Brief us, what are the details we need to know about a purported second leg of a bull market? All right, good questions there, Tom. Uh, first off, in the shorter term, the uh, first half strength tends to indicate second half strength as well. Uh, looking back to World War II, the uh, second half is traditionally up about four and a half percent. But if we're up by more than 10 percent as we are right now, the average gain is eight percent, not the four and a half. And you can add about uh, 13 percentage points to the batting average or frequency of advance. Uh, item number two is that on June 8th, we advanced by 20 percent off of the October 12th low. History then says that the market, unlike the uh, messenger from Marathon who said rejoice, we conquer only to fall dead from exhaustion, continues to advance an average of 14 and a half percent, about four and a half months until stumbling into a decline, averaging around 10 percent. So we tend to do very, very well in the short term. We stumble a bit, but then 12 months later, we're up about 18 and a half percent overall. How does positioning factor in? Because you look at money market funds, and of course, there's been some cash coming out, but there's still $5.4 trillion in money market mutual funds. Can you build a bull case on that alone? I would think so, because if the first half, you have a lot of the money managers who are underperforming. Those who either want to earn their bonus or keep their jobs are probably going to put the pedal to the metal and try to play catch up and then exceed the market by year end. Um, history also says that you probably want to uh, look at the first quarter or first half momentum because the top three sectors in the first half tend to go on to beat the market in the second half after a positive first half, usually doing so by about 100 basis points and outperforming about 60 percent of the time. So that being said, of course, there's going to be probably a massive game of catch up here. Is it fair to call this a risk on market, though, or do you see this bid for big tech not necessarily just being about AI, for example, but a haven bid as well? Well, I, I think that we are actually, if the question really all also has to do with leadership uh, and the narrowness thereof, I would tend to say that that is broadening quite nicely. Right now, 75 percent of the 153 sub-industries in the total U.S. stock market are above their 10-week or 50-day moving average. Also, we're looking at more than 60 percent are above both their 10-week and 40-week moving mm -hmm. averages. Uh, so looking at an equal weight 500, 60 percent are above uh, the our right. positive territory so far this year. I just want to point out, folks, that what you just saw there was Greifeld channeling the inner Bramo. I mean, that was that, that was just, bearish. You don't ask Sam Stovall some bearish gloom question. Stovall, Stovall and his father are the kings of being the market to prosper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. OK, that was the inner Bramo. It was captured <laughs> on the Bramo cam. Sam Stovall, we had somebody on earlier who said rotate to energy stocks. What does big oil look like right now? I mean, the price of West Texas comes crashing down, but I would suggest energy stocks have been pretty resilient. What is the five-star, four-star call on big oil? We have a market weight recommendation on big oil right now. Um, certainly, we are seeing... Uh, the, the downward move, mainly because energy was the best performing sector, up 59 percent last year, the only one in positive territory. I think investors are essentially taking their profits. And from a relative strength perspective, you know, they're dipping more than one standard deviation below the mean. So I would tend to say that if you are a longer term investor, you definitely want to be nibbling here. You know, Sam, I, I, I look at this and I bring this up with immense respect for your father as well. This week we lost Mr. Markowitz, Harry Markowitz, which is the foundation academics of everything Sam Stovall and I do. And in the Washington Post uh, obit, uh, Brian Murphy's great effort, at the top of the story, there's, there's Harry Markowitz saying, I wish I bought more stocks at 25. And I thought of your father. Are our younger people underowned in equities because of the day-to-day -day financial media gloom? I think that's certainly a case. I mean, the old adage is if it if it bleeds, it leads. 
And so basically the financial media wants to say the world is coming to an end at midnight. Tune in tomorrow to see if it really did. So I, I think that really does put an artificial pall over the market, over uh, investor confidence, et cetera. Uh, and investors have to realize that you only need about a 12-year holding period uh, to go back to World War II and never had a decline. Uh, and that traditionally, you want to be in equities. You, re you really don't want to be elsewhere if your goal is to outpace taxes and inflation. Sam Stovall, thank you so much. Coming up, folks, this weekend, the world is going to end. And because of that, you'll have to stay tuned to us on Monday uh, as well. What he says there, and, and Markowitz said this in a great quote I put out on Twitter uh, year, years ago, Harry Markowitz couldn't go on financial TV mm. because, you know, he was too optimistic. Just diversify, own it, and never sell it. And it wasn't a message, you know, in the, in the, in the miracle that we invented uh, here. It really wasn't part of the script. The script is OMG, the real yield's up. Yields are up. We're yeah. all going to die. Um, bit dog, 60 to 30,000. Total failure. West Texas, all 120 to 69 on oil. OMG, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. That's the game. Or go and, into cash. <clears throat> I mean, that's also been one Excuse of the me, high... We don't say cash here. We say triple leverage cash. Go into triple leverage yes. cash. That's been the Smart. trade of the past year, year and a half. It's starting to unwind now. But again, to you, the common yes. actual wisdom, to, tear up. to your point, is that just buy an index fund. Just stay in the market. <clears throat> buy your well, index fund. One of the best conversations, folks, I have ever had... Uh, in all the history at Bloomberg, this was the late John Bogle and Cliff Asnes. It was a, the interview's out there. I, mean, I have to find it. We'll redo it for YouTube. But John Bogle, God love him. He invented it. He was a pinata for 20 years. And the answer is, we're still asking ourselves, okay, what's the non-efficacy of an index fund? There isn't one. It's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Should we quote the equity market with optimism? Yeah, why not? Let's do that. S&P 500 up four-tenths of a percent and we say good morning here staggering to the end of the second quarter it is june 30. we're going to get out front of a third quarter everybody's got certitude to believe we believe for the third quarter katie what's really changed here from a number of years ago is we used to also say and we believe for 2025 that's gone. I don't hear that anymore. Yeah, it feels like, I mean, we talk <clears throat> about 2024, of course, the year ahead, but it really feels like all of the focus, all of the conversations are really centered on where do we go in the next six months? How do we end this year? And the big debate, of course, is in the bond market. The stock market, like we've been talking right. about all morning, has shocked a lot of people with just not its resiliency, but its robustness. I mean, this rally that we've built this year has been pretty stunning. And we'll see it here again as we go into earnings season. And seriously, Lisa Bram was really committed uh, to doing more on earnings. I'm going to go to where Mike McKee is and look at the WIRP, the World Interest Rate Probability uh, Panel, updated, freshened in a draggy way, extending out timelines. And even with all this fancy math I don't understand, <coughs> excuse me, May of 2024, we begin to see rate cuts. Says who? Says who? Certainly not the Fed. I mean, I feel like uh, we've heard from time and time again yeah. from Jerome Powell, rate cuts are not in the conversation. It's premature to talk about them. And yet you look at pricing, people are talking. I'm going to tear up here. <laughs> Can I quote LIBOR OIS once more? LIBOR OIS 0.2674%. Last time. What's the world without LIBOR? No, you don't see it. We'll this is Bloomberg. Out. Good morning. A strong majority of committee participants expect that it will be appropriate to raise interest rates two or more times by the end of this year. The median committee participant believes the FOMC needs to do more to get inflation back to our target. And here I have to confess, I do not fully share this view. Mr. Bostic of Atlanta, and he has been forthright here, and I, I make jokes about it, folks, but seriously, when Bramo lines up the speakers of the Fed, uh, 
you know, the messaging here is going to be really, really something coming off of Sintra. Thank you to Francine Lacroix and our team at Sintra for, I think, really uh, complete coverage there with some really piercing uh, questions. But it's part of the Fed debate uh, that we're going to have going forward. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramwitz on assignment. Catherine Greifold with us here, and she'll be with you through the day and particularly the real yield this afternoon. We're going to digress right now, get right to it, because this conversation is so valid. And this is the base, basic, basic idea that redounds across the Pacific Ocean to America and the Western world, which is, to borrow from Steinbeck, the summer of our Chinese discontent. And even more importantly, maybe like the great summer novel, or the winter novel, I should say, there's a mystery to it. Leland Miller is expert at the Chinese mystery, co-founder and CEO of China Beige Book. Leland, what is the measurement of government authorities in Beijing, the mayors of these selected cities, what is the measure of their summer of discontent? I, I think the major problem here is that uh, you know China's moving off its old economic growth model, but it hasn't moved comfortably into what's next. You're seeing much slower growth overall. You're going to see a long-term structural slowdown in the Chinese economy, uh, and and that they haven't truly prepared the world for that or their people for that. And so uh, things are happening uh, that aren't 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 entirely unpredictable. But it's a different world than we were looking at three years, five years, ten years ago. And I think this is confounding markets and it's confounding a lot of uh, investors. My my book of the summer three years, five years ago was the brilliant Elizabeth Economy writing on the third revolution, Xi Jinping and the new Chinese state. Give us an update since Dr. Economy is working for Raimondo at Commerce. Give us an update on the power of Mr. Xi right now. Does he have economic power and political power to help his China? She, she is China right now. She is the Chinese economy. This is why it's it's so ridiculous to continue to watch people predict, you know, reversals of Xi's policy as if he's going to get up one morning and say, you know what, I think I've been governing the economy all wrong for a number of years. Maybe you know, let's rehabilitate property. Let's do big fiscal stimulus. Let, you know, let's 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 do a great financial crisis level, uh, you know, monetary easing. None of these things are going to happen. There is a new trajectory for China. It is governed completely by Xi's inclinations. It has been for a long time. And so the idea that he's going to jump in in order to help investors out with the stock market or, or on, in rates and other things, it's sort of ridiculous. Well, why won't he, Leland? What is sort of the feeling on the ground among Xi Jinping and his administration? Why wouldn't they unleash a massive round of stimulus at this point? Well, look, the, the first thing is, is that, uh, you know, big fiscal stimulus would be a major and embarrassing reversal for Xi Jinping, who has worked very, very hard for years in order to constrain, uh, to constrain property growth, to constrain credit into areas of the economy where it's just going into a black hole. They've been working very, very, I mean, we've got some beautiful charts about how this deleveraging economy in China has just shown, you know, less and less borrowing, less and less credit pumped into problematic sectors. They don't want to reverse this. They're not scared. Uh, you know, the other thing is the economy is not as bad as people think. You know, it's 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 not in need of big bank stimulus. I think the last point there is everyone talks about monetary stimulus. We've been seeing monetary stimulus since the beginning of 2023. It hasn't been working. It's not the cure all that people think it is. Well, Leland, in your words, it would be an embarrassing reversal of their policies uh, to reverse course and stimulate this economy to a really meaningful, substantial degree. To you make the point that you know the economy isn't as bad as expected, but is there a chance that it deteriorates to the point where it forces their hand, or what's your outlook? Sure. At the end of the year, you know, inflation in China right now looks looks relatively healthy, unlike the rest of the world. Uh, if you had a problem when would you sort of flipped into deflation by the end of the year, sure, there would be more more policy support. You know, if if there's a more of a global economic slowdown and exports fall off a cliff, they have not fallen off a cliff. But if they did, then I think you'd see more policy support. Uh, but the reality is, is that people have given up on the Chinese recovery because they had outrageous expectations at the beginning of the year. And the year-on-year -year comparisons have made, uh, you know, sequential improvement calls very, very difficult. So what we've been trying to do is just cut away the noise. Are things improving month to month to month? The answer is yes. They're improving in retail. They're improving in services. The economy looks better now than it did in Q1. There is definite improvement here. So it, are things great? Are we getting the economy we were promised by a lot of people in January? 
No, but things are not nearly as bad as people are making them out to be right now. Partition the domestic international economy. We do this separately in the United States, folks. We look at Y equals C plus I plus G plus NX. We fold in all the international blah, 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 domestic final sales. Can you do that, Leland Miller, in your China? Do you have a domestic final sales GDP measurement? Yeah, we, we, we try to stay away from the GDP number just because it's been so traditionally juiced in China to, to, to not mean anything. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's an output, uh, or, you know, it's, it's almost an input versus an output. Uh, but look, we do look at domestic orders versus export orders. Export orders are not looking great. If you look at the going westward, particularly the United States, they're slowing down. But, ex but domestic orders are actually fine. They're looking better. So, you know, are we, you know, if your expectations were that you were going to see this mega rally in the second quarter, then you're definitely hands in your right. hands in your head disappointed. But if you're looking for sequential improvement, if you're looking for an economy that's significantly <clears throat> better than both the first quarter and market expectations, that's where China is right now. And I think people just don't get it yet. Tell me about renminbi. Yuan is a measurement. 7.26 is jaw dropping. It is a devaluation. Do we get a further depreciation of renminbi, which exports their disinflation across to America? Well, I think we do see continued weakening of the yuan for the simple fact, not because the economy is falling apart, but because the Fed is being very vigilant in terms of keeping rates high. And rates are not high in, in, in China, and they're also under some economic pressure. So the fact that the currency is being hit and you're seeing a depreciation move I don't think should be surprising. Now, keep in mind, this is all within a window. And right now, the window is expanding a little bit from what we've traditionally seen because we're in new territory with what the Fed is doing with higher for longer. But this does not, this is not a signal that the bottom's falling out of the economy and therefore the currency's failing. And, you know, I, you can get on Twitter and you can lose your mind with these types of nonsense. Well, that's what we want here, Leland. Last, we got like 30 seconds left. I'm so sorry. Take us away from the Western babble on China. What's the clear beige book message? The clear beige book message is that there is a recovery in Q2. I think second quarter data from the government is going to be above expectations, with market expectations right now. Uh, and people should stop, uh, you know, expecting big stimulus. It's not going to happen. Monetary stimulus has already been happening and it's not working. And fiscal stimulus in a big way is not going to happen until the economy is much, much worse. Leland Miller, thank you for the brief. The China Beige Book uh, this morning, just superb there. And, you know, Katie, as he says on GDP, it's not really a believable statistic. And we talk about 6%, 5%. OMG down from years ago, 7% as well. World's coming to an end, 3%. I'm not even sure I can believe those numbers. And when it comes to China, I mean, the I'm glad that you brought in the renminbi because it's been really Are interesting. You okay there? I'm OK. I'm yeah, doing okay. good. I'm doing OK. I want to talk about the yuan, though, because for four <clears throat> days this week, the PBOC has set the fixing stronger than expected. And when you think about also what's going on in Japan with the yen, it's just another story <clears throat> about that strong dollar. Well, some of the Pacific Rim dynamics here and the uncertainty, uh, to say the least, I'm looking at uh, dollar. I look at CNY, not CNH. CNY is sort of like the old school uh, <coughs> vanilla uh, a statistic, but you know, I'm looking at a moonshot of depreciation from the third week of April, mm -hmm. and the answer is we've gone from 6.90 up to 7.26 yuan. It takes more yuan to buy a given U.S. dollar, and I believe I heard Leela Miller allude to further renminbi depreciation as one of the tools that the Chinese have. That was brilliant. We're going to continue this discussion coming up. Really anticipate this. Uh, UBS Wealth, Global Wealth Management, always opinionated. Paul Donovan, really worth staying uh, for. Futures up 18. They advance. This is Bloomberg. <music> Bloomberg surveillance on a Friday, an important Friday, June 30. Usually, well, nobody in economics is working, except maybe McKee, but there's maybe like one data point. Not, there is a ton of economic data coming out of here in nine seconds. We do it again at 9.45 at 10 o'clock, the University of Ann Arbor stuff that we see. But right now, there's just really important economic data for Jerome Powell. Mike McKee, why does Jerome Powell care about this data this morning? 
Well, the uh, Fed is watching inflation, and this is their <clears throat> favorite inflation monitor, PCE. Personal income data has dropped. It's uh, up four tenths, which is the same as the prior month without revision. Stocks lift. And a little bit better than the three tenths that was expected. I'm looking for the report, which uh, did not uh, <clears throat> there it comes. load correctly. There we go. All right, personal spending up a tenth. That is worse than expected and certainly down from the eight tenths the month before. But the numbers the Fed cares about are the deflator PCE inflation on a headline basis up only one tenth, which is what was expected compared with a four tenths rise the month before. Uh, on a year over year basis, 3.8 percent, first time below the uh, four percent <coughs> level since uh, the pandemic began. <laughs> on a core basis, we are at uh, three tenths for the month, a uh, little bit, uh, well, it's what was expected, a little bit less than it was last month, 4.6. So it drops a little more on a base effect than had been anticipated. Uh, personal income and spending had been revised. I said eight tenths. It's been revised to a six tenths gain in April. So uh, the drop to one tenth is not as uh, big, but it is still. Um, Somewhat interesting that Americans are spending a little less. Now, what I have to do is get the uh, actual report. I'm going to let you do that here. Let and, me, uh, let me dive that. into the market move here, Mike McKee. This is important data here, and we're thrilled. We've got Paul Donovan coming up from UBS here and his thoughts on disinflation. We get a lift in the markets. We are up 15, 16 on SPX. Standard & Poor's futures now up a solid 25, up six-tenths of a percent. NASDAQ rockets. Greifeld looking for the $3 trillion Apple statistic here on the opening up eight tenths of a percent. Uh, NASDAQ, one, uh, uh, NASDAQ rather up uh, 126 future points this morning. The VIX comes in a little bit, 13.45. Bond market sort of a churn. We give up the higher yield scenario. Mike McKee, that's got to be the deflationary uh, attendance here. Guys, do you have that chart made up yet? I just asked for on PCE deflation back pre-pandemic. I'm sorry. This is a big deal, folks. On radio, we had the, Pow the world of Powell as he knew it. Mike McKee moonshot to 7% on PCE deflator, and we've given back half the inflation. Am I right? Yes. And uh, <coughs> the move downward in the headline number is continued good news. It's the core that uh, the Fed is worried about, sticky inflation. And 4.6% is not much of a move uh, over the last couple of months. We've sort of <coughs> been treading water on the core side. Yeah, let's talk about the core side a little bit more. Powell, of course, we heard from him a lot this week. And one of the things he said is that he sees getting to 2% core inflation by 2025. You look at 4.6% on PCE core, still a long way to go. Yeah, and um, I'm waiting for our chart to update that will show you what uh, the the Fed favorite number is of PCE services x right. housing. So I'll get that for you in just a second. Okay, why don't we move on here, and we'll come back to Mike McKee on that, and of course we'll have it in the nine o'clock hour with Matt Miller as well. This is one of the amended inflation statistics. He's one of the greatest thinkers on Wall Street. I mean this seriously. He's chief economist, UBS Global Wealth Management, far more a student of the Pacific experiment of China and America, far more a student of Brexit, far more a student of continental Europe as well. We welcome Paul Donovan. It's been way, way too uh, long. Paul, I love, love, love your comments on Sintra. Everybody's out there pounding the inflation bandwagon. You're with Ed Hyman. You're with David Rosenberg. Disinflation is in place. Discuss. Well, we're seeing disinflation. The, you know, the, the three waves of inflation that we've had, the demand shock after the pandemic, the supply shock of the war, and then the profit-led inflation, wave one and wave two have gone. You, you know, we've had six months of outright deflation in durable goods prices in the United States. Transitory inflation was transitory. Oops. Energy prices fading completely from the picture. And now what we're starting to see is this squeeze on margins coming through. Now, every country's got weird technical stuff going on with its inflation numbers, which creates a little bit of noise, a little bit of distortion. But just draw up any inflation chart around the world, and you are seeing the numbers coming down. That's, I think, the, the disinflation narrative is going to start to become a bit more established. 
I want to talk about profit-led inflation and how that differs or is the same as uh, what we're seeing when it comes to margins. <clears throat> What's going to be the biggest impulse in that disinflation that you're talking about? Is it the margins decreasing or how does that actually translate through? So profit-led inflation, it's, it's a it's a bit of a weird term because it's really a relative price shift. To be very clear, profit-led <clears throat> inflation does not take place across the entire economy. It takes place at the end of the supply chain. It's with retailers, with very strong corporate brands, so food brands, clothing brands, people who are very, very close to the consumer. And what happens is you have stableist demand and companies find a good excuse to pass on a margin increase. So if we look in the United States, retail profit margins as a share of retail GDP, pre-pandemic, those are averaging about 14%, 1-4% of GDP. Now, 21%. So you've seen that margin expansion coming through. Large and small companies, it's not just big business, small business does this as well. But what's now happening is customers are saying, you know what? I don't believe that story. I don't think that profit increase is necessarily uh, something I should be paying. I don't believe why prices are going up. You're seeing more discernment amongst consumers. You're seeing politicians start to get involved. And with that, with the threat of brand damage, companies are starting to perhaps be a bit more cautious on their margin expansion. And with that, that final stage of inflation is starting to turn into a, right. a disinflation report. <clears throat> then, Paul, what is your, I mean, you're doing more of a broader economic chit chat. I get that. But let's play asset allocation now. What do you and UBS Global Wealth Management say after the bang up bull market we've seen? How do you recalibrate on an allocation basis in equities into the second half of this year? Well, so for the time being, you know, equities for us are a moderate underweight um, because there is still this optimism about earnings, which perhaps you know, needs to be looked at a little bit around the world. You know, there, there are some challenges. And remember, of course, the equity market is more skewed towards the good sector than the service sector. You know, the economy is very, very service sector faced. Uh, focused. The, the uh, equity market's a little bit more good facing. And there we're seeing more of the moderation of demand, more of the disinflation pressure coming through. So the macroeconomics are not creating a sort of a vibrant equity market. I'm not saying it's a disaster. I'm just saying it's, it's something where I think equities are more likely to underperform. And as central banks are confronted by an inflation rate that continues to come down, then the expectations about rates are going to shift as well. You know, they can't keep hiking inexorably. Even Powell has got to learn to stop tightening policy at some point. And with that, the bond market gets a little bit more support. Can we withstand higher yields? I mean, I get the idea of your case and others are very respectful, Ed Hyman at, at, at Evercore ISI. I mean, the, the basic idea here, Paul, is if we delay a disinflation, if we get some form of higher rate regime, there's a belief out there we all fall apart. Says who? Well, I'm a little bit skeptical about the idea that we all fall apart, I have to say. I think economies generally have become less interest rate sensitive uh, over time. You know, monetary policy and to a lesser extent quantitative policy, they become blunter tools. Uh, in the uh, uh, the range of options that a central bank has got. So absolutely, I think that there uh, is less likely to be a complete collapse. And what we've got to remember is that when we look at economies, it's the middle-income consumer that's really the engine of any advanced economy. And middle-income consumers are actually doing okay. They're more resilient. Now, I'm not saying they're not slowing down. They are slowing down but with low unemployment, with rising female participation in the workforce. Very important point, that. With the fact that middle-income consumers have a lower inflation rate than headline consumer price inflation suggests on both sides of the Atlantic. All of that combined is giving the middle-income consumer that little bit more firepower when it comes to spending. Not enough to reverse a slowdown at this stage, but enough to make sure that the slowdown is not, in my view, going to be too severe. Well, Paul, maybe the economy has become less interest rate sensitive, as you say. And if that's the case, does that mean the Fed ultimately has to go higher on the terminal than cycles previous? I mean, if the upper bound right now is at five and a quarter percent, do we need to go above six to really cool down the final areas of the economy that are still pretty hot at this point? 
I think that's a very, very difficult question because I, I think you need to sort of pause and reflect on what is changing and what isn't changing in the economy. I mean, this is why the, the sort of relentless chant of hike, hike, hike that comes out of the fanatics at the Fed is, is really quite troubling. You know, stop and think for a moment, guys, because I think what you've got to assess is, OK, well, look, the, the transport sector, Leo, travel and so on, that's not necessarily changing. There is this fanatical desire to go on vacation all of the time. Well, actually, then perhaps you've got a totally different world emerging post-pandemic in that sector. But then look at the deflation that's coming through in durable goods. So we've got something different going on there. So I think you've got to balance this out and consider what relative prices are doing as well as the aggregate. How much of this is the fiction of owner's equivalent rent, which we know is going to be coming down in the future? Again, an important factor. I think that the central banks also need to broaden their thought. I mean, they've got quantitative policy as an additional weapon. They've also got regulatory policy. And, of course, that's going to become a topic in the United States. If you start to tighten bank regulation in the wake of the uh, implosion of Silicon Valley Bank, um, that's <clears> going to be something which is going to have a, a cooling aspect on the economy as well. Paul Donovan, thank you so much. With UBS, Global Wealth Management. Katie, that's really the, the you know, within 48 hours to see Bill Dudley framing out a higher rate regime and Donovan joining Ed Hyman and others just saying baloney disinflation's in place and we've got to frame out where we're going to be in September which is a lower rate regime and we're seeing really Huge the debate. extent of pricing power really interesting stuff on profit-led inflation yeah. and this being sort of the last part of the cycle. yeah I, I think Paul answered that really really well on a time basis this is the last part of it I my my take on it I'm underplaying it I could be wrong on that what I know is equities are up SPX six tenths of a percent we say good morning on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. Katie Greifeld in for Lisa Bramlitz and John Farrell. We will be here Monday. We went out, got this surveillance Rolodex out, tried to find <laughs> the person that will be here with us as well. Michael McKee here on Monday as well. What 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 is wrong with you and me? With our seniority, you'd think, you know, we'd be off, off, you, off. You, you would think. <clears throat> I mean, if Katie's going to be here, I can't. You know, if she's going to work hard, I'm you got to show up. Got to yeah. show up. Did yeah. you gotta find your up. service sector statistic? I did find our service sector statistic, and it's actually pretty good news. The uh, uh, core services X housing Jay Powell's number drops to a 0.23 increase for the month of May from 0.42. It had gone up a little bit in April, and on a year-over-year -year basis, we're now at four. 0.53 percent down from 4.61. So some easing there. But one number that might concern the Fed, uh, although there are people who are saying wages are not driving inflation now. Uh, but we did see wages rise half a percent, the strongest amount since January. I mean, and then that goes to the jobs report, July 7th, where Mike will be here as well. Mm -hmm. here yeah. here as well. I'm, Lisa, I'm actually off. Lisa and then. Brama won't be back by then. Well, we'll get, you know, we'll get somebody. We'll, we'll call her up and. What's yeah. your first Tell look at July? It's the first time I've asked this. What's your first look at employment, July 7th? What's interesting is that, uh, <clears throat> of course, we'll get a lot more. Uh, forecasts in from sure. uh, from economists as the week uh, progresses. But right now, the expectation is we might see unemployment drop back from 3.7 to 3.6. Uh, and the forecast is for 200,000 jobs, which is interesting. It's after, terrible. After, after <laughs> jobless claims yesterday, the total number went down. Guys, you, you have no idea how surreal it is for me and Mike to talk about a gloomy labor economy generating 200,000. I'm still depressed about LIBOR. <laughs> Future's up 29. It's a bull market. The airlines are doing less with more. The, they have more employees now than they did in 2018, but the government has fewer air traffic controllers now than they did four years ago. And this mess is going to continue for the next at least five or seven years because the FAA doesn't seem to have a plan to resolve the shortage of air traffic controllers. Helene Becker, with decades of experience and the major message, I mean, you look at T.D. Cowan and the Cowan and Company, it's Kaivon Rumor and Helene Becker, and they just flat out own the airline business for 30, 40 years. I mean, it's just it's an incredible uh, duo there of expertise. And what's critical here, as Ms. Becker says, she's never seen this before. It is a Friday. We haven't even talked about the smoke in New York. I'm going to say, Katie Greifeld, it's not as bad as it was. 
couple weeks ago. Do you agree with me on that? I would agree with that. We'll see what the weekend brings. <clears throat> yeah. but We'll see what the weekend brings, and it's a haze and all that, and we'll give you updates on that. We'll be here on Monday as, as well. But what's far more important is there's some serious ramifications to this airline mess up. We address this now. Uh, the points guy, let's be, just be blunt, he changed the way all of us travel. Absolutely revolutionary. So much so that Clint Anderson was an iconic guy at all sorts of TV networks doing the charade that we do every day. Clint Anderson said, no, I want to get frequent flyers on Alaska Air. I'm going to join with Brian. How did you get to the points guy? How did they drag someone as famous as you on MSNBC over to a real job with a points guy? Well, you know, the points guy is obsessed with points and miles. That's always been our sort of DNA. But over the years, we've expanded into a full media brand. And so they wanted somebody who had a little bit of media experience yeah. to come in. So that's sort of where I came in. And it was right before COVID. And so it was the perfect timing because I was able to right. help drive the news. Was this expected? I'm going to suggest that the debacle of Fourth of July weekend in America is new and original. Do I have that right? So unfortunately, since COVID, we've seen this holiday after holiday. We got through Memorial Day, but remember, Christmas time was a mess. We had a real mess last summer. At the time, we were blaming airline staffing, so there wasn't enough pilots and flight attendants. Now it seems like they've been able to hire up, but now it's the air traffic controller issue that's really helping to drive this. You know, thunderstorms are a normal part of summer. <laughs> we mm -hmm. should be planning for that. Uh, unfortunately, the airlines are scheduled really tight right now uh, as if there's no such thing as thunderstorms. So there's, there's blame to go around, but the air traffic controller shortage is a real issue. A real issue. And talk about the demand picture, too. Obviously, a lot of people want to fly right now, which is maybe why that shortage with the air traffic controllers is really being felt. Yeah, you know what's really interesting? Business travel has not fully recovered yet, but it's been more than made up for by leisure travel. So the demand is insane. And remember, during COVID, the airlines cut back on the number of flights and the number of seats that are for sale. Mm -hmm. And people decided during COVID, I'm going to travel. I don't care what happens. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing that pent up demand and people who decided that's going to be a way of life for themselves. A way of life. Uh, it's interesting, though, that business travel hasn't really caught up. And I do want to talk about <clears throat> the summer travel season. But with business travel, I mean, is that coming back or when can we officially declare we're not going back to 2019? So it really depends on who you ask. We're sort of 80 percent level of business travel. I don't think it returns fully ever. I think people have learned how to do Zoom meetings. <clears throat> Uh, companies have realized it's really expensive to send employees around, and they don't necessarily need to in right. all cases. So I think that's what you're seeing. On a planning basis, and, you know, the points guy is a concept. I mean, you guys reinvented how we travel, the whole keep track of your miles racket and the charge cards and all that. But what if I'm fascinating here? It's the same old, same old. We have limited airports, limited gates. Mm -hmm. We have a major argument between gates at JFK and Newark just as, as, as one uh, discussion point. I'll even pull in LaGuardia on it. And then we got air traffic controllers. Now, I look out on the web, and they're making $130,000, $150,000 a year. So I'm up in the air, and there's a guy with seven lights on a radar screen. And I look at the pilots that were complaining they make sixty grand a year which is like a bar, worse than a bartender. Yeah. I don't get the salary structure we're complaining about. Shouldn't we just pay the air traffic controllers more? Shouldn't we just pay the pilots more to solve this labor conundrum? I think that would help solve it, but that's going <clears> to <throat> cut into the airline's bottom line, and they don't necessarily want to do that. Air traffic controllers, that's a good middle-class solid job that you could end up doing very well. I'm not sure why it's not an attractive option for young people. I think they're trying to do some recruiting at colleges and places like that, but it's tough to get people interested <clears throat> yeah, but, in but, the job. Okay, but I don't buy this. If Kirby was here or Bastion was here, yeah. I'd say, look, you guys are fancy. I get it. You want to make your profits and all that. The fact is on this Friday, or I think Abramo, she's probably down in Atlanta right now at Hartsfeld sleeping on a floor somewhere. Yeah. Why are we acting like a third world country where we've got families with kids sleeping on the floor in the new Terminal A at Newark? That's a good policy for these airlines? Totally unacceptable. And that's why as consumer advocates of the points guy, my own personal opinion is that we should have some kind of passenger bill of rights. Now, there is a passenger bill of rights being proposed by Senators Markey and Blumenthal, even though even if that was passed, though, which is unlikely, 
The problem is it doesn't cover for weather. So the airlines mm. always have wiggle room when it comes to weather. They can say, oh, well, that chain reaction started because of a storm on Tuesday, so we don't have to compensate passengers. I think maybe something stronger needs to be in place. Is there mm. any blueprint for that, though? Maybe it doesn't exist in the U.S., but when you look overseas, I mean, how is that handled there? I would love to see something passed in the U.S., like EU-261 compensation. What is EU-261 uh, So basically, if a if flight is delayed extreme amounts from three to six hours or it's canceled, the airlines have to compensate passengers. In almost all cases, I've personally benefited from this with an American Airlines flight from Europe, but here's the issue. There is an exception for weather in those cases right. as well. Mm -hmm. Even still, I mean, a lot of people would make a lot of money uh, when you think about just the cancellations <clears throat> that we've seen. Let's talk about this summer, though, because even with the conditions that we're talking about, I mean, the demand is off the charts, especially internationally. I mean, you've heard several airlines talk up what they expect to see in terms of overseas travel. Is that actually going to materialize? Absolutely. Uh, you know, when you see $2,000 flights from New York to Rome, you know something's up. And I think part of the issue is they've reduced the number and frequency of flights. And so what's happening is uh, those yeah. seats are very much in demand and prices are spiking. But there is deals out there, I promise you. Every day we publish a deal at the Point Sky, and there are deals to so, be had. Clay, come on, you're a grizzled <laughs> media pro. How's Katie doing here? I mean, Katie's joining She's us. Amazing. She's amazing. Yeah. She's killing it. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the the, the, the discussion we've seen is phenomenal. And what you got to know, folks, and this is really, really important, she grew up in the crucible and the brutal reality of this odd horse thing called dressage. And what you don't know, it's like where the East German judge gives a figure skater a bad score, and you know, like, OMG, Jim McKay, wide world of sports, how could they cheat her? So let's go to the dressage ranking of Catherine Greifeld oh, here. Oh, no. Was she excellent? <laughs> Was she fairly good? What, did you ever get in dressage? Katie Greifeld, I believe I'm Batman. Where did, did you get did that? You, oh, please, we have, we have interns can do anything. Oh, did my you God. ever get an in, insufficient or fairly bad ranking? I've gotten an eight and I've gotten a two. You're scored on every movement and I've been with some really mean judges. Well, I'm afraid that's <laughs> not executed. Is that not, the horse? Never gotten a zero. <laughs> No one's uh, been executed, so, It yeah. is so strange. This is really tight, intricate moves with the horse, the Germans and the Austrians. Horse dancing, this. if you Tell will. us about Batman, who's like 400 years oh, old. Oh, my God, he is. He That pony is 26 years old. Uh, I've had him since I was 11. We grew up together. He's just... He's an incredible animal. And still doing, still like competitive he's, and all that. He's been retired from dressage. Now he, just, <laughs> been, he hangs I, out. I can just see it. Clint, they're going to go to me this afternoon. <laughs> Tom, you know, we're looking at the <laughs> dressage score. I'm going to be not executed. Congratulations. And are you still doing this? I am still doing this with a with a younger horse now. Uh, Batman can get a break after Very good. decades of service. With some real national ranking here, Katie Greifeld in dressage there. What are we going to give her? She just killed it. That's what we know <laughs> so well. We've dragged her in here for July 3. We will be with you to start the third quarter on Monday. Frankly, really looking forward. This has been, I've said this before, folks, this is an incredibly unusual time coming out of the pandemic all the courage of people to come out and make the, try to make the right decisions. Sometimes they have and sometimes they haven't. But through all of it, what it's really been about is to just use the markets and use the economy to monitor where we are. I guess I got a fair amount of gloom out there for Q3. We did not see it in a 2% first quarter GDP. Certainly with the equity markets uh, lifting, it'll be something to study as we come to you Monday and on through the third quarter. Futures up 28. <laughs> I can't believe it. I rounded up 4,500 on the Standard & Poor's uh, 500. On the open, Matthew Miller, Larry Adam, Raymond James. He was in the market. This is Bloomberg. Good morning.